Okay, so I'm recording to the cloud. <laughs> what, what's going to happen when it closes, Zoom closes, it will give you an option to save. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share my screen. And okay, people, can you let me know if you can uh, when you see this? Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah, Fine. I can see it. Okay, so uh, let me start by saying uh, I'm Paul Teitelbaum, I'm a history buff. Uh, I wanted to make it clear in, in advance that I'm, uh, I'm not a historian, I don't have any sort of advanced degree. Uh, so I'm a history buff like people here, a student. Uh, I do have a relatively recent bachelor's degree uh, uh, where I majored in ancient uh, Mediterranean history. So uh, what I do have is uh, I've, in the last uh, 10 years or so, I've, I've gotten to sit in classrooms at Columbia with some of the best professors in the world going through this material, being led by them in a very systematic way. Uh, so let me say that if anybody wants to get a bachelor's degree starting when they're 60 years old, I strongly recommend it. It's the greatest thing in the world. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let me start. We're going to be talking about uh, Greek art before the classical period. So that uh, is mostly the archaic period and the things that lead up to that. So I want to first talk about my sources. Uh, this is Professor Yanis Milanopoulos. He is a professor of classical archaeology. He was my professor in his course on uh, Greek art and architecture. Really fabulous guy, tremendously knowledgeable, terrific scholar. Uh, the book to the right I also very much relied on. Uh, and Robin Osborne is a historian, not really a, an art historian. It's interesting that um, as, as fabulous as Professor Milanopoulos was, he steadfastly refused to try to talk about the meaning of what we were watching. He restricted himself to talking about uh, what we were actually seeing in the influences and the trends. And uh, Osborne's book takes the opposite tack and tries to talk about what we can uh, try to conclude or, or, or uh, surmise about Greek society from their art and that is something that I've tried to include in my presentation. Um, and I'll be using at some point some images that I took from a YouTube video, uh, this one by uh, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. And when this uh, is over, I'll ask uh, Zach to post that link uh, on the YouTube site so people can see the full video of theirs if they wish to. So with that, here we go. The first point I want to make about Greek art is how little of it has survived. We know that wealthy individuals commissioned paintings to hang in their homes. We have stories about artists' lives, their rivalries with each other, and their passions for their models. But in fact, not one single panel painting survives from archaic or classical Greece. And none of the few surviving wall paintings can be attributed to an artist known to us from ancient writers. With sculpture, we are somewhat better off, but mostly what we have are Roman copies of Greek originals. For example, this is a copy of the Doriforos, the spear carrier by the Athenian master Polyc Polycletes. But, and this is a pretty good one, but it's only a copy and some of the copies are really, vari you know, really not measuring up in quality. The originals of these statues largely were done in bronze casting and get an example of what these things can actually look like, how fabulous they are. Uh, these are cast from bronze and um, these are known as the Riachi warriors and they were rescued from a, a shipwreck. Um, somebody is talking and please go on mute. Brought that up. Uh, Beverly, I think you're, can you please uh, mute your line or who, who well, is Beverly's on? muted. No, I'm muted, but who is, who is talking? Okay. So, uh, 
no wall painting, uh, very few uh, original sculptures. What we do have are paintings on tens of thousands of, of clay pots. Oh, you show me so I can explain it to her or you can write it down then. Uh, can we find who is speaking and get them to- uh, Paul, you have an option to uh, mute everybody. Let me see if I can figure that out how to get to that. Uh, we can mute ourselves. I mean, this yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but, but apparently people don't. Some people don't mute. Oh, it's one five seven one two. Oh, um, it's one five seven one two. Uh, Paul, just uh, if uh, if you if you want. I'm uh, not sure how to get to it. To tell you the truth. Oh, okay. So if you go to Zoom and just yeah. click on that person, I'm, you should. Yeah, I'm just not seeing them. I think it's Ava. Ava. Oh, sorry. Please mute your line. Thank you. We got it. Okay, great. Thank oh, you very okay. much, Ava. Okay, so back to the slideshow. So uh, we do have paintings on tens of thousands of clay pots. While we can regret that larger works did not survive, the quantity of the surviving pottery has some advantages for social history. We could be confident that we are observing the changing tastes of purchasers rather than the quirky demands of a particular patron or the battle of an avant-garde individual against an enlightened market. Now, the pots were created to be used and these are the, there, there are more, but these are the basic categories of, uh, of uh, pots that the, the Greeks used. I'm gonna get my laser pointer here. So the amphora was used to basically a storage vessel for both liquids and solids. Hydria was a water carrier. The kithos was used for uh, scented oil uh, in a funerary context. Eurybolos is a uh, perfume bottle. Craters and adenos are used as mixing bowls to combine wine and water. The psyker, kind of interesting, is designed to be filled with ice and then you put it inside a crater and it floats in there and cools the wine. Uh, these psychers sometimes are decorated with scenes of dolphins on their side. So they kind of float around in there and you see the dolphins. The Winokoe is a wine jug. Kilix uh, is a, are cups and the Cantharis is also a cup. And this one is specifically associated with images of Dionysos. So uh, art uh, is, is in, in this Greek world, has a purpose, it has a function. Uh, and um, Robin Osborne argues that the pots and the archaic statuary should be read as a social history of art at work. Uh, and you can divide that into a public sphere and a private sphere. So in the public sphere, in a funerary context, the art conveys messages about the dead and uh, both there and in temples and shrines, it, the art constructs relationships between humanity and the gods. In the private sphere, the art marks particular achievements, politics, war, and sports, and also serves uh, concrete functions in the symposia, which is a drinking party, a very uh, elevated and, and uh, sophisticated drinking party, but nevertheless a drinking party where there were contests of wit and singing and sexual contests, conquests, and the pottery would both be used to serve the wine and so forth. Uh, and it was also in some cases, as we'll see, given as prizes for the various competitions that were happening in the context of the symposium. Our starting point for all of this is the Bronze Age collapse, which happens, uh, at least the 
My starting point for what I'm going to show today is the Bronze Age collapse, which we're dating to uh, the 1100s BC. And this was really devastating for Greece. There was large depopulation. They lost centralized administration. Uh, agriculture greatly diminished, uh, according to Professor Billows at Columbia. They actually lost agriculture. They lost writing. Greeks had been literate using, literal, using linear B, and with the Bronze Age collapse, they lost writing for 400 years. They became illiterate. And this is why this period is known as a dark age, because we have no writing from it. We have no records. And in terms of the uh, specific presentation today, we also lost figurative art. For the next several hundred years, the primary center of organization was the oikos. This word means house, but it also means extended household. The head of the oikos was the basileus. This word came to mean king, but its earlier meaning basically referred to the lord of an oikos. Collectively, these lords and their family members constituted the aristocracy, and the earliest art was created to serve their interests. The large decorated vases come from elite graves where they were used to contain the ashes of the dead or to act as markers on top of graves. Most of the statues were offerings to the gods dedicated at shrines and temples where they expressed the concerns and gratitude of the aristocratic worshipers. The temple offerings and the grave pottery addressed unseen powers, but also conveyed social meaning by asserting the elite status of those who could afford to commission these works and give them away. Starting in the ninth century and extending into the eighth century, we start to see bronze, ho bronze horse figurines dedicated ch at shrines throughout mainland Greece. This is one of a large number of Argive horse statuettes found at temples of Zeus at Olympia and Artemis in Arcadia. The statuette dates to the mid eighth century. The uninterrupted curves uh, convey power and balance and the figure operates fully in three dimensional space. Wherever angle you look at this at, uh, it's designed to be seen from that angle. This is something different. This is a Corinthian figure also found in one of the Peloponnesian shrines. It was, made about, it, was, it was made about 20 years after the Argive statuette, and it conveys a totally different conception of the horse. If the Argive horse was a rider's horse, then this is an artist's horse. The horse makes aesthetic sense, but not realistic sense. The form has been purified and abstracted. In this period, the horse was not used as a beast of burden and had no economic value as such. But for the elite, the horse both acknowledged and granted power. The aristocrat dedicated the statuettes to honor the god and obtain his or her favorable influence. At the end of the eighth century, there is an abrupt change. Horse statuettes and horse uh, featured images totally disappear from sanctuary in the southern Greece. What does this signify? We have absolutely no idea. The story of Greek pottery after the Mycenaean period is about increasing elaborations of geometrical design. Most of the pots were recovered from graves, where uh, in the earlier period they uh, contained ashes of the dead, and later they served as markers on the graves. Craters and amphorae with handles at the neck stood on male graves. The neck is the narrow part on the top of the pot. Uh, and amphorae with handles on the belly, like the, uh, the pod in the center, stood on female graves. As time progressed, the geometric designs increased in prominence and complexity. Decorative zones expanded and the dark zones contracted. The expansion of the decoration leaves an impression of lightness compared to earlier pots. Here we see the high geometric style. We now see the meander pattern on the top right. Instead of the wavy lines, I'll just go back a second, you see the wavy lines in the center. 
they've been now been replaced with these right angle meander patterns, which are now to last throughout uh, all of, of Greek pottery painting. Uh, if you look at the concentric circles, they're so finely done that you can actually see moiré patterns. And overall, the one of the objectives of the geometric uh, design is to fill up all of the em empty space. Paul, can I ask you a question? Sure, please do. Uh, are there any remains of how they did the pots? I mean, they have a wheel. How, how do they... These were thrown on a wheel. Okay. They're all, these are all thrown on the wheel. The interesting thing, and I should have mentioned this, that, that uh, I went through the list of all the things that were lost uh, in the, the Bronze Age collapse. What wasn't lost was the craft of how to make pots. So the actual quality of the pots didn't really decline very much. They didn't lose the ability to use the potter's wheel. They knew how to refine the clay and stuff. So, yes, we're looking at wheel thrown pots of very high quality. Now, Paul, one more. Well, point now that, <laughs> go ahead, Mary. Go ahead, Mary. No, 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 now that you mention it again, I'm sorry, but uh, what was the reason? What was the, why happened the Bronze Age collapse? Do we you know, know? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer that now because it's, it's we, we've, you know, it's going to take me so far afield okay. and I really want to get through my material and I want to leave enough time for Greg. So I'm going to uh, ask you to, you know, we, we can discuss that. We've discussed it many times before. We can address it again if we have more time at the end. Okay. I no problem. Okay. And then Marika, you could listen to the previous presentation of Archaic Age. I actually listed all the reasons why it collapsed. Good. Yeah. Thank you. you. It's on the YouTube channel, which I'll post uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we are in the 9th century BC, and we start to see a big change, the return of figurative art. At first, these are animals, deer, birds, horses, and you can see on the vase, it is high geometric. There's no empty space at all. There are the meander patterns all over it, but now the design elements uh, are these repetitive images of animals. And you see the little diamonds under the animals. There's the, this geometric idea of you got to fill up all the empty space. Really rapid progress. This crater was made in Euboea between 750 and 725 BC. In the conception and the use of figures, this vessel typifies much of the most elaborate of geometric pottery made outside of Athens. The animal figures are not intended to create a scene from life. They're very stylized and they fill the field in a symmetrical balanced way. The widest part of the vessel contains a continuous frieze of grazing horses and birds. Above them are a series of larger panels. If you look at that on the right, uh, which are called uh, in Greek metopes, which I think means windows. The horse at the mangers with double axes, you can see that on the far right, um, evoked the horse taming epic heroes and overall this pot gives a message of wealth and power. Now the Athenians had a very different idea. This is a crater uh, and it was found at the Diplon gate of the uh, Kerameko Cemetery in Athens. It's, there are several of them known as the Diplon vases. There's a, they're huge. Uh, there's one of them in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it's about as big as people. Uh, it, this one dates from 750 BC, so it's more or less contemporaneous with the Euboean vase that we just looked at. Here though, in the central panel, we see a scene known as the prothesis which is the laying out of the body. The standing figures to the left and right are tearing their hair in mourning. The reverse side, which we're not seeing here, shows the ekphora, which is the carrying the body to the grave. We're now gonna see things that become conventions in Greek art for hundreds of years afterwards. Note that the figures are all silhouettes. Uh, the torsos are just empty triangles and all the faces are shown in profile. So that will be this idea of seeing 
frontal torso, but a, a profile head. Uh, so these become unifying traits of archaic vase painting. The shields that the warriors are carrying on the bottom uh, are called diplon shields, and there are absolutely no uh, examples from archaeology that tell us that this ever did existed, ever existed. So as far as we know, these were purely an artistic creation. Were they double axe? Pardon me? No, they're shields. You can see the individual's head. If you look at the one here, here's my pointer. If you look at this one here, you can see the individual head and you can see the spears that he's carrying and his legs coming out the bottom. Same thing over here. So these are shields. These are not axes. No, do I they, they're do not. They, do they evoke the double axe handles? Possibly. No, no. I meant, are they meant to look like double axe? As I say, no, I don't know. You know, it's, you know, it, it, very possibly, uh, it's hard to know what's in people's minds. But uh, certainly that's, you know, that, that's a plausible hypothesis. So comparing the, on the left, the Euboean vase, on the right, the Diplon crater. The, the Diplon vase takes a major artistic step forward. It's not simply that human figures dominate rather than animals. The figures on the Euboean crater evoke a world of wealth, but they do not engage the viewer with a relationship to that world. In contrast, the Diplon vase invites the viewer to engage in the world they are viewing. The vase arrived at the cemetery immediately after the scenes that are depicted on the vase. The prothesis, the laying out of the body, the ekphora, and then this vase was carried to the cemetery and ashes were deposited in it. So essentially, the Diplon vase opens a dialogue between art and life. We must also note its limitations. We see an event that the viewer can relate to a common event, but it's formulaic and we do not yet see anything that we can call a story. There's no specific narrative here. I, uh, may I ask one quick question? Sure. Is, is this actually the vase that's in the crater that's in the, the entrance of the Greek and Roman section at the, at the Met? No. It looks very, very similar. There, there, as I said, there are a whole series of vases from the Diplon Gate called the Diplon Vases, and that is another, the one that's in the Met is another one, but it's not exactly this one. Many of them show the prosthesis, the one in the, the prothesis, the one in the Met does, uh, and it's quite similar, but this one is, uh, is uh, I believe, in Greece. Very good. Oops, okay. Now we get something different. This is a wine jug, a winokoe, and it was produced in Athens, Athens about 25 years after the Diplon vase. Around 730 BC, the pottery put into graves are now items made for use in life rather than specifically designed for the tomb. So this is a wine jug. The body of the vase is, is traditional geometric, but the scene on the neck is completely different. You see the detail at the right. It still uses the traditional triangular torso silhouette. The shipwreck scene depicted is decidedly not formulaic, and it lends itself to multiple interpretations. A single man straddles the keel of an overturned boat while his shipmates sink with the fishes. Conceivably, this could represent Odysseus, but it could also represent a real event. These dangers, shipwreck, being eaten by the fishes are associated with the explosion of colonization and trade that the Greek world experienced beginning in the eighth century. For these adventurers, these were the dangers of everyday life. One of the results of this activity was that the Greeks experienced greater influence from the more advanced societies to the east. This inaugurated what is known as the Orientalizing period. So this is a different idea. This vase is not important because of its image. What we have here are what is uh, known as the, what is the first literary illusion in all of Western history, a reference that is sophisticated and witty. This is called Nestor's Cup. 
Uh, it was taken from the island of Pithecusae, which is modern Ischia in the Bay of Naples, also around 730, 725 BC is its date. Decoration combines geometric elements with new motifs from the east, but the most notable feature is the graffiti edged into the side. I am Nestor's cup good to drink from. Whoever drinks this cup empty straight away, the desire of beautiful crowned Aphrodite will seize him. So the first Western literary illusion, Nestor's cup appears in the Iliad, but it is not the grand, but this is not the grand glowing cup described by Homer. Homer describes it as studded with golden nails, fitted with handles, four all told, and two doves perched on each, heads bending to drink and made of solid gold. An average man would strain to lift it off the table when it was full, but Nestor, old as he was, could hoist it with ease. Homer's description of Nestor's great feat is a parody of the formulaic scene in the Iliad in which a hero performs an incredible feat of strength. So for example, in book five of the Iliad, we read, Diomedes bent for a stone and picked it up, a boulder no two men alive could lift, though he could heft it easily. This mass he hurled and struck Aeneas on the hip, crushing the joint. So with the graffiti on this cup, Homer's joke, comparing the cup to the scene of battle, is now nested inside of a new joke by the people who were using this very humble cup at a drinking party. Each of the three lines represents a different individual's contribution to a competitive drinking game. One person improvises a line, and uh, we should note that here we have people who clearly can read and write. Not only can they read and write, but they're familiar with, uh, if not with Homer, with the stories that underlay Homer. And they're capable of improvising poetry in the epic meter, because these lines are written in, uh, in dictalic, dictalic uh, hexameter, which is the epic meter. And so on top of Homer's joke, they're making an erotic joke based on the scene from Homer. Uh, this is a, a kind of a, a second example of pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's a wine jug from Athens, basically from the same time as Nestor's cup. And here's see the inscription, he who of all the dancers now performs most daintily. So they're saying once again, this piece of pottery was a prize for competition at a, dr at a drinking party. And we should be aware that this jug and Nestor's cup are the two earliest examples of the use of the Greek alphabet. So what we see are Greeks getting rambunctious. We no longer see this conservative, aristocratic, formulaic thing, but you see people who are dying you know. to have narrative and stories and improvisation. The world is changing. Uh, Robin Osborne writes, any easy superiority which a wealthy elite may have enjoyed in 800 BC had come seriously challenged by 700 BC. So as I said, this period is known as the orientalizing period where influences were coming in from the Near East. Uh, the uh, animals depicted in the vases that we saw previously were domestic, deer, birds, horses. Now, Coming from the east, we start to see fantastic creatures of the imagination. Not only painted pictures, but now we on the right, the objects themselves, the pots themselves morph into monstrous animals. The pot on the left shows a sphinx, a monster with the head of a human, body of a lion, and the wings of an eagle. The central item is a cast bronze griffin dating from the first quarter of the seventh century that would have been decorating the rim of a bronze cauldron. Uh, and here's another example of the orientalizing period. Uh, the item on the left is a geometric bronze statuette. I'm sorry, uh, I missed my place. It's an ivory sphinx that was dedicated to the sanctuary of the goddess Hera at Corinth in the middle of the seventh century. On the right, also dating from the mid-7th century, is a pendant 
made from electrum, which is an alloy of gold and silver. Both items show strong influence from the East, but they both contain new purely Greek elements. In particular, note the triangular shaped heads. This style is called didelic, though I must say that Professor Milanopoulos really objected to that term, but uh, I'm gonna use it anyway. Uh, and so didelic is named after the mythical architect Daedalus who built the labyrinth uh, in Crete. Another Greek innovation is the remarkable facial expression of the ivory sphinx. The Eastern Sphinx was monstrous. The Greek version is a winged visitor, visitor of inscrutable power dominated by pensive human expression. We now shift our focus to statuary. This is a geometric bronze statuette. It's called the, Monte the Monticlos Apollo, dating from the first quarter of the seventh century. It is the statue of a Kouros. Oh, let me get rid of this. Uh, it is the statue of a Kouros, which means beautiful boy. In common with the Sphinx and the amulet on the previous slide, the distinct, distinct Greek features are very pronounced, the didelic head uh, and the long braided hair. Also, we see another unique trademark of the Greeks. The statue is nude. Other statues from both the Near East and from Egypt are always clothed. Uh, the statue also displays what's known as the archaic smile, an inscription on the figure's thigh, which is in Boeotian form of the Greek alphabet, says, Manticlos donated me as a tithe to the far shooter, the bearer of the silver bowl. You, Phoebus Apollo, give me something pleasing in return. So we see this item, this idea of aristocratic exchange. Professor Milanopoulos stresses the verticality of this figure expressed in the part in his hair, which connects with the line down the front of his neck and down the sternum and then uh, ending with the separation between the legs of the statue. Absolutely. This is known as the New York Koros because it's in the Met. Uh, oh, can so I ask a quick question about when you talk about the oriental, um, the pieces that you showed before. Yeah. Is it possible that they were made for export? No. And not? No, not? no, they were, found on, they were found in graves and shrines. So okay. they, they were used either, to, right, as funeral monuments or they were used as offering to the gods in Greece. They're definitely not export. So the New York Koros, we see major uh, advances from the Monticlos Koros, the Monticlos Apollo. Among other things, it re represents the use of a new material for sculpture, marble. Uh, some places use sandstone, which is easier to carve. It's a little softer. But we still see the didelic head and the braided hair. But this statue uh, is inspired by something new in Greek art, and that is the influence of ancient Egypt. The pharaohs, I'm sorry, the Egyptians had canons of proportion for human figures dating back to the statue on the left of the old kingdom pharaoh Menkore. He was the grandson of Khufu who built the Great Pyramid around 2400 BC, so 1700 years before the Koro statues. Over the next millennium and a half, a second canon was developed by the Egyptians, and that's exemplified by the second Egyptian statue, which is the Pharaoh Mentuhemet. It's more or less uh, contemporary with the, with the Greek Koros statues. But what's uh, remarkable here is that the New York Koros exactly implements the Egyptian canon. It, the Egyptian canon divides the body into 23 groupings, and it says in the seventh grouping, you see the shoulders and so forth and so on. And the, the uh, New York Koros just hits it right on the nose. Also, notice the bodily posture, the bodily stance. Uh, the left leg is advanced, but the movement of the foot is not followed in the musculature. There's no weight being placed on the front leg. So we see stasis rather than movement here. About 50 years later, 
we see something called the Anavisos Koros. And there are increasing steps towards naturalism. The hairstyle is still there, but the didelic head is gone, and we, we see the archaic smile fully expressed. The anatomical details of the torso are now fully in the round. Uh, in comparison to, New York, to the New York Koros, where the chest and the abdomen are just suggested by subtle incisions. Also, unlike the earlier statue, the Anavisos Koros is beginning to shift its weight to the leading leg, which conveys a greater sense of movement. An important thing to notice about these Koros statues, and there were many of them, is their anonymity. They are not portraits. They are idealized rather than representational. They were used both for temple offerings and grave markers, and they returned the viewer's gaze without adding any mood or experience. The Metuhemet statue is expressive, look at his face, and impresses himself upon the viewer. And the other, in, in contrast, the Kuros invites the viewer to write himself on the statue. These are the women counterparts of the Koros. They're called, uh, statues called the Kore, which in Greek, uh, among other things, means daughter. This was a, always a standing female, always dressed. The waistline of the Greek statues was emphasized by a belt in, as opposed to the smooth contours of the statue of the Egyptian goddess Mut, shown on the left. The Kore statues were brightly painted and were somewhat more imaginative than the male Koros statues. Kore statues were usually used as temple offerings and were depicted holding an offering to the god, a small bird, an animal, a piece of fruit. They had very elaborate jewelry and very highly decorated clothing. If you look this up uh, in Google, you can see lots of examples of, of, of modern models of what these things actually look like with their very bright colors. I didn't include them because the modeling, at least in my view, is inferior. And I wanted to show you the real deal, but it's interesting to see what they actually look like. The um, statue on the right is known as the um, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the um, the name escapes me for a minute. I'll come up with it in a, in a second. Um, but unlike the others, it's not a statue uh, from a temple. It was a grave marker. Uh, but unusually, there is an inscription on it, which basically says that this person uh, basically died on the day before her wedding. So she remained a core, which means a daughter. She never became a wife. Uh, but it's also a reference to the myth of Persephone. Uh, Persephone, as you may know, was kidnapped by the god Hades, the king of the underworld, and taken down to the underworld. And in all those myths, Persephone is, is, uh, is, ter is, used, is called by the name of Kore. So it explains why this particular statue was found in a grave and not in a, uh, uh, in a temple. It's called the Peplos Kore. It just came back to me. Um, the Peplos, yeah, the Peplos Kore. So we're now going to return to the uh, to pottery, and we're going to start tracing through the developments starting in the seventh century. Uh, narrative myth now becomes firmly established in Greek art. This vase is of the type known as a relief pithos, so it's it's impressed with uh, carving with uh, impressions like a seal is found in a grave on the island of Mykonos, dating to about 675 BC. This is a detail of what is on the neck of the pot. Uh, and it's, there's no doubt at all that we're looking at the Trojan horse and the sack of Troy. The scene uh, shows a hollow horse with Greek warriors looking out through windows on portholes. This is the body of the pithos, and subsidiary to the Trojan horse are horrible scenes of the sack of a city, featuring the wanton murder of women and children. Robin Osborne comments that 
this is a pot which manipulates the issue of viewpoint, both encouraging the viewer to see through the portholes of the horse as if he were one of the Greek assailants, and also presenting the sack of Troy as the slaughter of the defenseless that necessarily evokes sympathy for the victims of war. Progress is rapid now. This is known as the Polyphemus phase. Up to this point, the objects we've looked at have built on earlier developments. This is known as the uh, Eleusis, uh, Amphora Eleusis, because it was found in the sanctuary of Eleusis. It represents a major break with traditions. There are still a few vestiges of the geometric style. For example, the way that the painter tried to fill all the empty space between the figures with uh, little motifs. But the big innovation here is that the action is completely dominant. The figures are huge. In fact, these are the largest figures on any Greek vase. On the neck of the vase, we see the blinding of the Cyclops Polyphemus by Odysseus and his companions. The body of the vase shows the slaying of the Gorgon Medea, Medusa, I'm sorry, by the hero Perseus and his pursuit by Medea's sisters. There are important things to, to point out here, but my main point is this. The, both these scenes take the viewer into the world of myths and monsters. The bloody sack of a city that we saw on the previous slide was not unthinkable to a seventh century Greek. This was reality. But a one-eyed man-eating giant and women with snakes instead of hair who turn viewers into stone, elements like these take the viewer into a completely new imaginary world. This, I suggest, parallels the Greek venture into the unknown as they send out raiders and colonists all over the Mediterranean. You might ask the question, if you were a person in that, what is the worst possible thing that could step out of the unknown? Well, how about a one-eyed giant that eats you? Stylistically, we see continuity as well as innovation. The triangular torsos and profile heads, for example. But the storytelling is more developed. Odysseus has painted an outline and filled in with white paint to, different, white paint to differentiate, the hero, differentiate the hero from his crew. This on the body of the vase are Medusa's sisters. These images could be the most astounding thing that you'll ever see on a Greek vase. Snakes grow from their heads and shoulders. They have gaping mouths with vice-like teeth. Behind their teeth are lines that could represent their gullets, but they kind of represent smiley faces. This makes the whole thing have a very, very eerie feel. Are these monsters or are they smiling? This representation is unique. There's nothing like this anywhere in all of Greek art, and we will later see a conventional uh, depiction of the Gorgon that's taken from uh, Near East. But this depiction does set a new standard. Note, notice that the Gorgon's faces are frontal. They are not in profile. And this establishes a convention for later artists. Frontal views are limited to monsters, Gorgons, satyrs, and so on. Very rarely the face of a human corpse is shown frontally. But when this occurs, it seems intended to shock the viewer by evoking the association with monsters. So back to the neck. Last but not least, one really important detail. Look at the tiny lines that interrupt the black silhouettes to suggest the armpit and the line of the abdomen. This is not painted with a brush. It is incised with a stylus. The lines are visible because the stylus has revealed the contrasting color of the underlying clay. The toes, fingers, and headbands of the three figures use the same technique. What we're seeing here are early signs that what is known as the black figure technique has reached Athens. The black figure technique was invented in the city of Corinth. This is a Corinthian, proto-Corinthian vase. Both Corinth and Athens were blessed with very high quality clay. When fired in an oxygen rich kiln, ferrous oxide in the clay reacts with the oxygen and turns it a color that depending on the clay can range from a warm yellow to orange to deep red. If the oxygen is removed and the temperature is raised, the clay turns black. 
Now we're going to show and start showing the images that I took from the Art Institute of Chicago video. The key to the black figure technique is the application of a type of slip that the Corinthians learned to make. Slip is a combination of clay and water. So it's clay that's spreadable with a paintbrush. Uh, what's special about this is that when it's subjected to high heat and then cooled, the slip forms an airtight bond with the clay below. This airtight bond makes black figure technique possible. So well, what's hap what happens here is that the, the painter paints the areas that should be solid black with a slip, leaving a window, a metope in the center. Then they go in with charcoal and sketch out the image that they want to paint. On this image, they use more slip to fill in the silhouettes that should be black. Then they etch. Using a stylus, they etch details into, through that slip into the, uh, the, the exposing the clay below. And finally, they'll put on added color. So basically the white paint, I'm sorry, the white paint is slip made from clay that's been so purified that it's removed almost all of the iron oxide. Uh, the brown uh, paint will have a deep maroon, reddish, almost blood-like color when it's fired. So the firing process, the Good boy, Aaron. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, yeah. Good Mark, boy. Mark, could you please mute? Sorry, sorry, sorry. So in the kiln, the, uh, pot, the kiln is first heated to uh, around 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit with uh, the vents open, making it an oxygen-rich uh, environment, and basically except for the white and brown painted areas, the whole pot turns red. In the next phase, they close the vents, they raise the heat, and they put uh, uh, leaves and wet branches in to basically drive all the air out of the kiln. And now, in the absence of oxygen, except for the painted, white painted areas, the whole vase turns black. Now, this is really the critical point because now the slip is starting to liquefy and, when, and it forms an airtight bond. When they then turn the temperature back down, reduce the temperature and open the vents to let air in, the, play tur the clay turns red again, except for the part that's covered by the slip, which is airtight. So whatever's underneath the slip stays glossy black and everything else becomes red. And this is the net result. Uh, you can kind of get the whole idea. And while we're, looking at, while we're looking at this, let me point out some conventions that we'll see in black figure art. Uh, first is the sym symmetry. So you see figures evenly divided on the ends looking towards the center. This is an image of Hercules. Uh, and he, uh, uh, often you see Hercules in images is wearing a lion skin. Well, this is where Hercules kills the uh, Nemean lion. This is how he gets the lion skin. To his right is the goddess Athena who is helping him out. Uh, so, as I said, you see, also notice on Hercules' face and the goddess's face, you see this frontal, frontal facing eye. So even though the face is in profile, the eye is not in profile. The eye looks directly out at the viewer. This is a characteristic of black figure. Um, so Athenian potters started to pick up this Corinthian style. And at first, they used it limited to kind of the same stuff that the Corinthians did, which was decoration and, and animals. It's very, very high quality. But uh, it's, it's still limited to the subject uh, matter that was used by the Corinthians. But the, um, the Athenians were very ambitious with their large, loveful, large pots and human figures and mythic narratives, so they did not abide by these limits for very long. This 
is known as the Nessos vase. It is a true black figure from the last quarter of the seventh century. Uh, Painter has completely assimilated the black figure technique, but unlike the Corinthians, he's used it on a pot scale that has incorporated the, uh, it's the Athenian love for big pots and mythic narrative. The figures on the neck depict, depict the struggle between Heracles and the centaur Nessos. There's a lot of new and interesting stuff here. One of them, if you look on the right, is that the painter is literate. So these are not aristocrats, these painters. They, are, they, are, uh, they lived in the potter's quarter. They worked in the potter's quarter of Athens and their vases did not make them rich. They did not, these were not like, you know, uh, a Pablo Picasso. Um, they were commercial items. Um, so literacy has now reached down into that, that group in, 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 the, in the last quarter of the, the seventh century. So we, there were some questions in previous sessions about how far did Greek literacy spread? Well, uh, we can see it now. I'm gonna cut this short uh, on this description here because I've got so much more to go, but I'll point out one thing. Um, the Heracles figure is shown dominating in a really humiliating way the, um, the centaur Nessos uh, by the way that he has his foot in the back of the centaur. Uh, and we'll see later that this becomes a trademark of depictions of Heracles. Also, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details, but this scene changes the narrative of this particular myth, which is among other things narrated in Sophocles. Uh, and the way that Nissos is killed here is different from the myth. In the myth, he's killed with a bow, in the, I'm sorry, in the written myth, he's killed with a bow and arrow and uh, Hercules is on the other side of a river. So you now see something really significant, which is that you have to understand these painters as not being illustrators of the stories that, that were otherwise going around. The painters, the good painters, the great painters were mythographers in their own right. They were creating new myth, every, much as, every sense as much as Homer was creating new myth. This is uh, Adinos, which is another uh, mix, uh, vase used to mix wine and water. The painter is um, known as, his name is Sophilos, active from 580, 560 BC. We know that it was painted by Sophilos because he actually signed his name on this. And he was the very first painter to sign his work. He revels in his literacy as he labels everything under the sun, including inanimate objects. Uh, he goes quite overboard in his inscriptions. The top register depicts a procession of gods coming to the wedding of Peleus, father of Achilles. Um, Professor Men Men Melanopoulos comments though that his conception was more ambitious than his skills. Um, so let me now talk about the conventions of black figure painting. When I say that the painters were uh, mythographers, they actually used many of the same techniques of the epic poets. So where the epic poets use things called type scenes, repeated scenes, such as the warrior arming, the gods arriving, uh, the warrior leaves for battle and so forth. In the same way, the vase painters had type scenes. And here, this type scene is called the chariot scene, which uh, shows uh, a figure on the left mounting or in the chariot or, and you see there's a lot of variety on the left, it's a wedding procession. Uh, and in the others, it's a warrior. There's a figure sitting in front of the chariot and a figure, usually female, standing behind the chariot. The thing to understand about this is that the, the black figure tradition was very conservative and very much beholden to the tastes of uh, the, the uh, customers. So, uh, it was dangerous to innovate because it might not sell. So when you, it's difficult for us when we view these things to appreciate this, but 
for the more that you learn about this, the more you will understand the the preconceptions that were in the mind of the audience, which allowed them to be shocked by a depiction. We're not shocked at it. We just look at it and say, okay, that's nice. But they were expecting something and they got something else. Here is a good example of this. This is another type scene and uh, it's a duel. And notice the warrior on the left. Uh, the left is the traditional uh, position of victory. So almost always the warrior heading from left to right is going to win. The, the warrior looking from right to left is going to be killed. And you can see that there is this, every one of these has the same posture where the, the victim is turning to flee, but their body is still looking behind, but with uh, lots of, of, um, of other types of variations. Um, so my point is that the audience understood these conventions and that created expectations about what they could see. The, the image on the right is by Exekius. And Exekius is the best. Exekius is the greatest master of black figure. And we're going to look at this again later. Uh, but what I want to show here is that what he's done is he's taken this traditional scene and he's turned it into a very specific instant in time. Um, it, uh, here he's representing the, and he shows it to us, the, the duel between Achilles and the Amazon queen Penthesilea. And he chooses the very moment when Achilles' spear enters her neck. We'll talk more about this, but this idea of freezing a moment in time as opposed to having kind of a generic scene. We see the same thing in Homer. When I gave my presentation on Homer, I, I discussed a simile where Homer jumps in and, and gives you like a cinematic moment that you can visualize as it's happening. And we see the vase painter here, the great artist, doing exactly the same thing. A really identifying moment, which when you combine that with the formulaic scene, creates a profundity that, that the audience would grasp immediately. So at this point, reaching kind of uh, where I want to start heading towards the final lap, and I want to show you the best examples of black figure technique. This is a Gorgon by Clitius, and I wanted to show it to you both because it's extremely well done and because I wanted to contrast this with the previous image of Gorgons. This is the prototypical image of a Gorgon that you see throughout Greek art, either as Gorgons themselves or sometimes very frequently you see it as a device painted on a hero's shield or for depictions of the goddess Athena, this is depicted on uh, what's called the aegis, which is something that she wears on her chest, which actually supposedly has the Gorgon Medusa's head on it. And it's used to strike fear into her opponents on the battlefield. And uh, the myth of the Gorgon is that anybody that looks at the Gorgon is turned to stone. Now you can imagine, this is a drinking cup. This is the interior of a drinking cup. So imagine, and a very big one, imagine this filled with wine. And as you drink it, you start to expose the face inside. And you know, if you, by time you finish this, I imagine that you're pretty inebriated. And there you are face to face with the Gorgon whose look turns everybody into stone. This is the artist known as Nearchos. And uh, it's a fragment of um, a pot uh, in which Achilles is, um, is uh, hitching up the team of his chariot horses. And look at the superb draftsmanship here. Nearchos is identified as a predecessor of Ezekius uh, and um, really beautiful work. This is another by Nearchos in a lighter mood and I wanted to show you the other side. So while you have the Greek heroes, here you have uh, the, the sexual con conquest aspect. This is an Eribolos, a uh, a perfume bottle, and it was often given by an older male lover to a younger male beloved as a love gift. And you see the face on uh, satyr. Satyrs are 
uh, uh, creatures that have human faces and torsos and the legs of goats, even though um, uh, Nearchus doesn't really stress that. And you can see how they are busy. Um, this is the painter Amasis. Uh, it's mid sixth century, so we're in the 500s. Uh, and he's, his work, he's known as a master of exquisite gesture, but is often criticized for being excessively fussy. There's no indication what the scene represents, and the interpretation is left to the viewers. This is another vase by Amasos, the Amasos Dionysos. The god Dionysos is holding his emblematic cantharos. That's a pretty big glass of wine. And he's being offered a hair by two of his followers, the Maenads. Here, Amasis exhibits a remarkable lightness of touch. Note particularly the dancing feet of the Maenads contrasted with the rootedness of Dionysus. Once again, though, there's no particular story here. This doesn't connect with a particular myth. And uh, you see the exquisite gesture and a reference to mythical figures, but not to a mythical narrative. So finally, we get to Ezekias. And Ezekias is one of, you know, he's, he's the greatest black figure. And, and to me, this is, the, this is the, the work that I enjoy most in all of Greek art. Um, this scene um, is the polar opposite of um, am the Amasis painter. Uh, Ezekias finds the height of drama and pathos in the myths he, he depicts. This is the scene uh, in the book 24 of the Iliad, where Priam, king of Troy, begs Achilles to allow him to ransom the body of his son Hector. The old man reaches out to Achilles in supplication, and while, while his servant carries a bronze tripod as part of the ransom, Achilles is touched a human moment and offers Priam a cup of wine. But unseen beneath Achilles' couch, look at that, lies the body of Hector, unseen by his father, just a few paces away. Back to the image we saw before of Achilles in Penthesilea. This incident occurs after the end of the Iliad. And in fact, uh, uh, on the one hand, Ezekias has more Trojan war scenes as a percentage than any other painter. However, only one of them is from the Iliad. Most of them are uh, material that's external to the Iliad, like this is. Um, the story here is that the Amazon queen comes to the aid of Troy and encounters Achilles on the battlefield. And the instant that Achilles kills her, their eyes meet and Achilles falls in love with her. Even though Achilles has the conventional black figure front facing eye, Ezekiel manages to convey the mutual focus of their eyes on each other. One characteristic technique employed by Ezekiel is the use of, of the spears to divide the space and to show uh, parallelisms with what he wants to emphasize on the painting, what he wants you to look at. So in this case, look how the gaze of Achilles is exactly parallel with the uh, action of his spear going into the neck of Penthesilea, and how the V formed by his sphere, spear and Penthesilea Penthesilea sphere forms a triangle that focuses on Penthesilea's face. At the same time, and this is my imagination, the depiction of Achilles is as kind of a soulless killing machine, which is what he became after his comrade Patroclus was killed in the Iliad. So from that point on, Achilles knows he's going to die. And he kind of just is sleepwalking out the rest of his life, killing those who come in front of him, taking no joy from it until finally he gets killed by Paris. This is the most famous work by Ezekias. I imagine that many of you are familiar with this. Uh, it shows Achilles on the left, the hero Ajax on the right playing a board game. If you see here, I got my pointer. 
if you see this writing right over here, this says, Exekius made me. Here we see Achilles, interesting noting that the writing is backwards from right to left. This says Aeontos, which is Ajax, from left to right. And in their game, Achilles says Tessera, which means four. Ajax says Tria, which means three. So it looks like uh, Achilles has won. Um, Ooh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to pause for a second. You are maybe not. Uh, I my script ran out, so I'm going to be winging it from here on. Um, look at the way that he once again uses the spears. The spears uh, basically force your focus into the game where their hands are. The real genius of Ezekiel is that what he makes the viewer do is wonder what's going on in the minds of these people. And he basically, in this case, he answers the question. He shows you kind of a moment in which time has stopped. These are the greatest heroes of the Greeks. In the middle of the Trojan War, they're fully armed. And they're, they're kind of, they've taken, they're, they're in a, a break from battle. And they're so fully absorbed in this game that there's nothing else in the world that exists. Uh, there are lots of uh, commentators here who talk about this as a competition. So, for example, Achilles is, is uh, you know, because of the helmet on his head, dominates the scene over Ajax. Ajax is more um, stooped over. And you can see that Ajax is more tense than Achilles because Look at their back heels. Uh, no, look at that. I'm sorry, their front feet. The uh, Ajax's heel is off the ground and Achilles is, is on the ground. So there's some tension there. And also, Achilles holds his spear looser than Ajax and they diverge from each other where Ajax's spear is exactly parallel. Um, but my take on this is quite different. I think that they have much more in common than they have in difference. We should remember that these individuals were first cousins. Uh, and look at the, at the fabulous detail of their clothes. Professor Milanopoulos comments that Ezekiel could use the stylus as if it was a brush. So their, their uh, accoutrements, their faces, they're so um, uh, elegant uh, that in fact, you really, if, the, if, if, if Ezekiel hadn't labeled them, you, I, I, I maintain that you would not be able to tell which one was Ajax and which one was Achilles. Uh, also, I want to point out, I hope um, Sergio is watching. Notice the armor that they're wearing. They are wearing everything in the, in the possible in the armory. In addition to their linen cuirass and their helmets, and if I go back, you can see there's Ajax's helmet on the back. They're wearing thigh protectors in addition to their greaves that are protecting their shins. And Achilles is wearing protectors for his upper arm. So they're wearing very unusual and uh, expensive and exotic pieces of armor. But to me, as I said, the, the image, the, 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 what this is really conveying is comradeship. These are two people who are gonna leave this and go out to battle which, and the Athenian audience, most of the men had experience of battle and they know that battle is not this uh, heroic endeavor. Battle is gore and blood and the stench of feces. It's a horrible thing. And here are these guys taking a moment's break from that horrible experience and sharing their comradeship together. I now want to finally, as a, the, the closing, I want to follow the way that the, the, specific, the special regard that Ezekiel has for the story of Ajax. So the, here we're seeing a, a fragmentary vase, and it is the death of Achilles. 
Achilles is the, fi is the figure on the ground. You can see that his head is bent almost 180 degrees back from his body as the crest of his helmet drags on the ground. And it's Ajax that is in the process of bending down to pick Achilles' body up and bring it from the battlefield. This was considered in, um, in, in, in the, to the classical Greeks, to the ancient Greeks, the greatest feat by uh, Ajax, who had quite a few things to his credit. I mean, he had a duel with Hector that he got the advantage of. He was the kind of like the, the fire brigade that comes to people's rescue in the Iliad. Uh, whenever they're in trouble, it's Ajax that shows up to bail them out, to help them. To It's Ajax who uh, defends the ships uh, when the Trojans are breaking through the wall and trying to burn the ships. But the, the Greeks felt that the, his greatest moment was, was the rescue of Achilles' body. And um, I f I'm not going to read them now, but I, you, can, you can find many instances in the Iliad where it talks about what happens to somebody when they stop fighting and they bend down to do something with a body, either to try to pull it back to their side, or if it's their own victim, they try to strip the armor. And almost all the time, when you do that, in the next five seconds, you're dead because you've exposed your body. You're no longer protecting yourself. And you see that Ajax has his shield slung over his back. He's totally not protecting himself at all. He has to focus on Achilles, and Achilles is enormous. So this is considered his greatest feat. Now, this is another scene by Exekius, and it shows Ajax carrying Achilles' body back to the camp. And I mentioned before that the, um, the position of moving left to right is the position of victory. And the position of moving from right to left is, is the position of defeat. There are many depictions of this by other artists, and they show Ajax moving from left to right in his glorious deed but not Ezekius. Ezekius wants to tell you that this is a catastrophe. There's nothing good about this. And that uh, Ajax is performing his, his last duty for his comrade. And, uh, and it's really tough. You can see Achilles' arm hanging over his shield. Uh, his eye is closed inside his helmet. And you can see uh, Ajax uh, straining here and taking short steps. Uh, they're both wearing essentially the same armor, the same ornate armor that we saw on the, uh, the scene of the, the players, the gamers. Also, uh, I'll point this out for Sergio, who loves armor. The shield that both of these heroes are carrying with these cutouts in the side, which kind of resembles the Diplon shield, is known as a Boeotian shield. And once again, there is no, ex no evidence that this actually existed. But it's used as a convention in, uh, in Greek art to identify a hero. It's only a very conspicuous hero that carries one of these Boeotian shields. So Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I always saw those shields in the past, and I always wondered how they're structured. I always thought that they would just form a shield wall with them and then would stick the spears in those little openings. Yeah, right. So it seems like they never really existed at all. That, that right. you know, that they're an artistic uh, convention to oh, basically- Oh, no, no. In, the, the Minoans had a shield. I, I don't know what it's called, but they- The figure a, of eight shield, but yeah. it's, the, the figure of eight shield is very different. Yeah, it is different, but- It's, it's it really- a, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, quite, it's, it's kind of similar in overall shape, but it, this is not a figure of eight shield. A figure yeah. of eight shield extends from your ankles to your shoulders. Right, 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 right? exactly. Uh, and uh, I think we'll later see that even though they're using the shield, it still has the hoplon grip inside, the argive grip, the two-handled grip. Right, right. Which is, which, so which is the, the, uh, the, the sign of a Greek hoplite warrior. Mm -hmm. So... Another unusual thing for Ezekius is that he painted the same image on both sides of the vase, or the same scene. Uh, but look at the difference here, and you can see that this, at least in my view, is happening later in time. Ajax is getting exhausted. His, his feet are further apart. They're bent, 
and he's had to hitch Achilles up further over his shoulder. He's now grabbing, if you look uh, here, I have the pointer. Right over there, you see uh, Ajax's fingers gripping Achilles' arm to keep him from slipping back over his shoulder as he's exhausted by trying to carry this huge figure and carrying both of their shields back to the Greek camp. Now, this, uh, in the, the, the myth of Ajax um, is that after this is over and after the funeral of Achilles, they, had, they were left with Achilles' armor. And Achilles' armor was a fantastic marvel. It was a gift of the god Hephaestus uh, made after uh, his armor was taken uh, from his, uh, his close friend, his dear friend Patroclus when he was killed by Hector. So he needed new armor. His goddess mother, Thetis, went to Hephaestus and got this fabulous armor. And there's a whole chapter, a whole book that Homer devotes to the making of this armor and the description of it. So the well, Greeks were me, then... Quick question. Sure. Why, why Achilles needed an armor if he was invisible? I mean, he, yeah, he was okay. protected. Why he need... I mean, okay, he so needed... really good question. The answer is that there's absolutely no indication at all in Homer that Achilles was invulnerable. There's nothing about that. Achilles can be killed and wounded like anybody else. This idea that he's invulnerable except for his heel, this is a much later story. It's not in the epics at all. Okay? Okay. Uh, there's, and there's quite a few things like that, you know, that, that you know, it's, so when, when you learn how, when these myths happened, you see how they developed and how they advanced and how the, each new person who retells the myth adds new elements to it and it becomes a new myth. So the, the invulnerability of Achilles hasn't happened yet. And in fact, there's actually a myth about the invulnerability of Ajax, uh, who, uh, whose, whose father, Telamon, was visited by Heracles and Heracles puts his lion skin on the baby Ajax and makes him invulnerable except for his armpit. Well, interesting things. So the, the myth continues that uh, the Greeks then uh, have to decide who gets the armor of Achilles, this fabulous, fabulous, priceless relic. And the two uh, contestants are Ajax, who carried Achilles' body off the battlefield, exposing himself to danger, and Odysseus, who fought off the Trojans while Ajax were carrying the body away. And the Greeks vote on it. And uh, the myth is that uh, Athena basically, with some tricks, basically stuffed the ballot box in favor of her favorite Odysseus. And Ajax goes insane. Uh, and that night, he's, he believes that he goes out into the, the herds in the Greek camp, their, 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 their cattle and their sheep and their goats. And in the delusion that they are the Greeks, he kills all of the animals. He takes one sheep back to his tent because he thinks that it's Odysseus and he's gonna to torture it to death. And then the madness rises and the Greeks get up and they say, what happens? And then they see that Ajax has gone mad and tried to kill them all. So he committed treason and also totally lost his honor, right? Because he's demeaned himself. Everything he was is gone. His whole life has become meaningless. And Ajax becomes dejected and so forth and so on. And finally, decides to take his own life. Now, this is the last image. And uh, in my mind, this is Exekius's masterpiece. This is the only black figure vase that has only a single person on it. And um, it, I talked a lot about how the uh, vase painters were mythographers creating myth. Well, uh, Greg is going to talk about Greek drama right after I'm done. And, and um, perhaps he'll mention Sophocles 
story about Ajax. But I maintain that what we're seeing here is a prefiguring of the story that Sophocles will tell. So Sophocles talks about how Ajax is tortured and crazy uh, until, and finally he has a concubine uh, um, whose name escapes me at this moment who finally kind of talks him down and he has this moment of calm and he realizes that his life is meaningless now. He can't go on. He has to kill himself. But he's going to do it in this thoughtful, uh, meditative state. And that, I think, is what's demonstrated here. Once again, as I said, the great genius of Ezekiel is making you ask the question, what is this guy thinking? What's in his mind? And to me, that's the, that, that question is, is what pops into my mind when I look at this. And, and you look at all the devices that, that Ezekiel does to, uh, to bring this across. First of all, Ajax is naked. And we've seen that in every other depiction of Ajax, he's armed to the teeth. So we're showing his, vulner he's showing his vulnerability now. He's stripped. He's stripped of everything in life. His honor is gone. His name is gone. His kingship is gone. Everything is gone. He's naked. But look to the left, to the palm tree. The palm tree is bending kind of in parallel with the shape of his back. Now, there is, there is some, there's something in scholarly circles called the pathetic fallacy, which is uh, basically means that a human emotion is transferred to an inanimate object. And there's an argument among scholars of whether the Greeks were capable of this pathetic fallacy. And I think to me that it's obvious that the answer is yes that what we're seeing here is the depiction of this palm tree kind of bending over in sympathy with Ajax to cover him in his nakedness and to protect him while Ajax puts in the ground the sword that he, that he was given as a gift by Hector in their duel. To the right is his armor, which has to bring to mind the armor of Achilles that was the cause of this whole situation. And so here we see the, the, the death of a noble man, a great man who was destroyed, but managed to find some type of reconciliation and redemption in a certain sense uh, uh, before he takes the final step of this considered act to throw himself on his sword and end his life. So that's what I wanted to say about this. Wow, this was uh, an amazing presentation. Um, I guess, did, does anybody have any questions? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I want to ask a question. Um, so overall, Paul, uh, would you say that all these potteries were originally for the elite classes of, of people in, in that, or was it just pretty well, much? Been well, the, they were definitely for the elite class, but what I'm saying is that the elite class expanded. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do I get this? Also, back? the quality of the vases was um, not very uniform. I mean, uh, they used the vases for a lot of things. So, there were other vases that they were only used for transport oil that they export or things like that. But, I mean, the ones that he showed at the end, they're exquisite. I mean, those are. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the interesting thing here, I, I, I took away my screen share, so I, everybody should be back to seeing the meeting. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, um, you notice that the other side of this is the symposium, where these guys would, you know, chase young boys, and they would chase women uh, who were called hetori, which means companions. They were basically high-class prostitutes. And so we have a lot of bawdiness, uh, and that was an elite act. You know, I mean, when you talk about an elite, you have to realize that within Athens, for example, 
uh, of the people in Athens, uh, maybe only 20% of them were citizens at all because women could not be citizens and foreigners could not be citizens. And of those citizens, an even smaller percentage could take their, didn't have to work and could hang out at night and, and have these symposia and chase boys and do all this other stuff. So the, the pottery served all different aspects of that society. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these Ezekias vases, the really great ones, were exported and were found in graves in Etruria in Italy. So we know that the Etruscans really liked Ezekias because they, they buried a lot of their, their elite people using Ezekias vases as grave markers. Paul, well, one question. The, um, I'm sorry, Rolf, go ahead first. Okay, thanks. Um, just a sort of peripheral comment. Um, as you noted in ancient Greek art, and this goes pretty much through the Greek period, the male body is very commonly depicted nude. I mean, okay, if they need armor, then, but even so, they'll often be fully armed, but you'll still see the penis. Yes, right. Women are almost always depicted dressed. Certainly, in before the classical period, there are no exceptions. They are always dressed. That's right. So this is, uh, as a, I study this a bit in sociology, this is uh, what we call in sociology, the male body was the privileged site of beauty. Yes. The female Nobody was interested in the female body, and this is presumably related to this homoeroticism and homosexuality. Okay, women were good for getting children, but the real lovers tended to be the young, the, the, the heroes, the powerful men would tend to have young men as lovers. Now, if you trace this through history, this, by the 19th century, it has gradually evolved. It has completely reversed. The women, there are vast numbers of women nudes Male nudes have virtually disappeared by the 19th century, which was a period of homophobia, uh, a real fear of homoeroticism and homosexuality, and the female nude body became the privileged site of beauty. So let me make a couple of comments on that. First of all, our modern society basically represents a meeting of the Greeks and the Jews, right? The Judeo-Christian heritage and the Greek heritage. And the Judeo-Christian heritage is homophobic in the extreme. Yeah. So that's what you see in my mind is, is, is this, you know, this abomination of, of homosexuality. So that takes it out. Well, it isn't yeah. just that, it's, it's anti-physicality. Uh, Christianity from St. Augustine on, it, it sort of found the, the physical, true, the true, body of both sex, sexes horrific. And with the decline of Christianity, we're emerging from that. We're becoming much more like the, the Romans and, and, and the Greeks in that respect. So common nudity and, and, and that sort of thing. So well, let, me tell, let, me tell you, let me tell you one more story, just definitely that directly relates to this. I think this comes from Plutarch. So Plutarch is, is talking about the origin of nudity in the Olympic Games. And the story that he tells, and I can't remember the names of the, the, the characters, but uh, that the Greeks used to do their races, who used to play in the Olympic Games wearing loincloths. And one day, one of the runners dropped his loincloth, and all of the other runners were too busy staring at his behind to finish the race. So this is Plutarch's, you know, explanation of how we... we you know, directly what, you know, what and Ralph said, joining this male homosexuality with, with the nudity in the art. Yeah, so by the 19th century, the naked female body, nobody was shy about the, the naked female body. That was a prime subject of, uh, of, of Western art, of, of the European art within the Judeo-Christian community. So the Judeo-Christianity at that point had no reservations about the beauty of the naked female body, at least in, in, uh, in, class, in art. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you listen to Pericles' funeral oration, he says, the best thing that can be said about a woman is that no one has anything to say about her at all. <laughs> right? Yeah. Women should have no public appearance of any kind. They should be in the house. And you notice 
one of the conventions is that women are always painted with white paint because they don't go outside. One question, Paul. Um, so I know you, you clearly delineated that uh, this is post the, um, or you can say like post the dark ages, so to speak, or the dark ages inclusive. But um, I don't see any effect or influence of Minoan art, which is the Minotaur. And there is none. Right. And I, I, I didn't want to go back to that. I mean, Minoan art was great art. And the Mycenaean art, which was basically a pale imitation of Minoan art, itself essentially died out except for these little squiggles and curly cues and spirals. That's all that, the, that was left after the Bronze Age collapse. So listen, uh, if, if, if people have other questions, I want to I wanna leave time for Greg to make his presentation. So I'd really like to turn that over to Greg. Uh, should, I, should I stop recording at this point? No, no, go no, ahead. No, no, keep, keep recording. But uh, I don't have any pictures. Okay, so, uh, we can keep uh, recording then. Well, we, yeah, have, we, have your pic we have your picture, that's, that's right. enough. We, we have all, so yeah. So this is like a, a continuation of uh, cultural tradition, but going now in the classical age and uh, uh, and more, more, more about um, the theater. Uh, so just in classical age, Athens produced uh, some of the most influential and enduring cultural artifacts of, of the Western, uh, Western tradition. So the playwrights of famous were uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Uh, all lived and worked in fifth century uh, uh, BC, uh, BC uh, Athens, uh, as did the historians Herodotus and Thucydides, uh, physician Hippocrates, uh, and philosopher Socrates. Uh, other notable ph philosophers of that period also been to uh, uh, Athens at one time or another, uh, uh, included Anaxagoras, uh, Anaxagoras, uh, friend of Pericles. Uh, uh, Democritus, uh, and also uh, Empedocles, Hippias, Isocrates, uh, Parmenides, uh, Heraclitus, and Protagoras. So the voice of antiquity, as a later writers, uh, uh, such as uh, Strabo, Plutarch, Diogenes Laertes, and Cicero, they all unanimously uh, declaring that Pisistratus, you remember the tyrant of Athens um, uh, in this uh, the second half of the sixth century BC, uh, BC. Uh, he is first um, committed the poems of Homer to writing and placed them in the order in which we read them today. Uh, he also commissioned the most prominent poets of the time to do that, uh, that, that were Anacreon and Simonides. And uh, then this work continued under his son, Hipparchus, who was assassinated, if you remember from that uh, presentation of the care gauge. So now tragedy, comedy, and satire uh, uh, play were three dramatic genres uh, that emerged in, uh, in Athens. Uh, so Greek tragedy, as we know, was created around the time of 534 BCE. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, during the festival of Dionysia, established by that same tyrant, Pisistratus, as you can see, he's done a lot for Athenian culture. Uh, and uh, traditional tributes, Thespis, you know, the Thespians uh, uh, come from this. So Thespis was the first person to represent a character in a play. Uh, so under the influence of uh, heroic, uh, like uh, the theater uh, was influenced by the heroic epic, Doric choral lyric, and, and the innovation of poet uh, Arion. Uh, it had some uh, narrative ballad-like genre. And it is an extension of ancient rites carried out in honor of, uh, honor of Dionysius. Dionysus. Uh, uh, so, it's evolved from the choral competition. I mean, I'll talk about this later. So tragic plots were most often based upon myth uh, from the oral tradition of archaic epic, epics. 
And uh, in tragic theater, however, these narratives were represented by actors, you know, because before it was just uh, 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 the singing, one person was singing the ballad, like, uh, you know, Homeric epic. Uh, now uh, the actors represented uh, the event. So theater evolved from choral, choral competition. And in the fifth century, Athens, there were two great drama festivals. One of them called Lenaia uh, and was primarily for comedy. It took place in late winter. Lenaia is, is a city uh, in the vicinity of Athens, uh, same as Dionysia, by the way. Uh, the other one took place in the spring in the city called Dionysia. Uh, An audience was mostly male citizens. Again, there is very little uh, role that women played uh, in the site except at home. Uh, typically, there were up to three actors and the chorus. Uh, so uh, originally, originally it was only one and a chorus, and then Aeschylus, who is the first great, uh, uh, you know, tragedy uh, uh, writer, introduced the second actor. So that was a, uh, you know. Uh, big change because now they, they, they could develop the dialogue between actors. Then Sophocles, uh, the, the, the next generation, uh, introduced the third actor, you know, and uh, that actually gave a lot more flexibility uh, to the plays. Uh, so there were many, uh, there were many playwrights at the time because we're talking about the whole fifth century and even later and the Every year, uh, there was a winner uh, at the Dionysia Festival. Uh, however, we really have the full plays that we found were only of those three that we know, is, uh, which is Aeschylus, Sophocles, and uh, uh, what's, what's, what's his name? Uh, uh, Euripides, yeah. Uh, OK, so. Um, now, for example, so you'd know how much we lost uh, out of, uh, uh, in, in Dionysia, Aeschylus won only five times. Uh, and same goes for Sophocles, he won only five times. And Euripides won only three times. I have a list of four, uh, you know, plays that they won with, but I'm not gonna uh, burden you with that. So all the, um, all the actors were male and they wear masks. Uh, so earlier in the year before the uh, uh, festival took place, uh, one of the archons would select three poets that would compete in a tragic festival. So there were only three poets per year that would compete there and only one of them would win. Then he would find three uh, wealthy citizens who would be the producers called Koragus. Uh, they would help to defray expenses. So they had to contribute a lot, usually wealthy citizens. Uh, famously, uh, Pericles was one of the Koragus in the production of Aeschylus play Persians uh, in uh, 472 BCE. Uh, uh, there were also 10 judges one judge from each tribe. If you recall uh, the uh, reforms of Cleisthenes, the father of Athenian democracy, he uh, reformed the society, created 10 new tribes, and now one judge from each tribe represented the jury. Now, uh, Aeschylus, um, who was the, the first uh, of the you know, famous playwrights, um, he was born in 523 BC and died in, at the late age of in five in 456, which is 67 years old. So he is the one who is credited to establishing basic rules of tragic drama. He's also uh, 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 was credited with inventing trilogy. So. Um, Trilogy is a series of three tragedies that tell one long story. 
and um, and the um, and and these trilogies were performed in a sequence over a full day, from sunrise to sunset. Uh, at the end of the last play, uh, there was also a, a satire play, which is kind of like was staged to revive the spirits of the public because the tragedy, probably like uh, 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 was uh, creating a depressed atmosphere, so they wanted to cheer people up. Um, so Plutarch in the life of Simon uh, recounts the first triumph of the young, talented Sophocles. So uh, against the famous unchallenged at the time, Aeschylus. So Sophocles was about 25 years younger. So it's a really kind of a different generation. It, it was a big blow uh, to the ego of uh, Aeschylus. Uh, uh, so this competition uh, ended up as a result that Aeschylus was not agreeing with the, some uh, procedural um, uh, elements uh, uh, of the festival. So it ended up in the voluntary exile of Aeschylus to Sicily. Aeschylus decided that that's it. I don't want to have anything to do with Athens. That was not fair the way they judged uh, uh, against this young kid. Uh, and uh, he left the Sicily. Uh, well, uh, Aeschylus is also kind of, it is said, we don't know if it's all true, but uh, he participated in uh, three major battles, Marathon, Salamis, and Plataea. Uh, we don't know if it, but at least uh, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, writings about this. We don't know if it's all exactly true. Most likely he did participate in marathon battle uh, and, and actually he wrote his uh, play Persian uh, from kind of personal experience uh, encountering Persian himself, even though the, the play itself is kind of different. It's, um, it's really about what happened uh, in, in Persia uh, uh, after uh, Xerxes came back uh, defeated. So, uh, now, um, so the, the Roman, po uh, the Roman po writer, uh, Valerius Maximus, uh, so he was writing at the time of the Emperor Tiberius, so he wrote this story about the death of Aeschylus, uh, because after he uh, exiled himself and decided to go and spend the rest of his life in Sicily, you know, when he got off the um, uh, a ship, uh, and he was killed outside of the city of Gela in Sicily by a turtle dropped by an eagle, uh, which has mistook his bald head for a rock, suitable for shattering the shell of a reptile. You know, and uh, actually, that was supposedly that uh, all antiquity laughed at this ridiculous death because uh, uh, apparently he just didn't manage to uh, live in uh, Sicily, but on his arrival was killed by this really crazy occurrence. Um, you know that the eagles usually take uh, uh, turtles, uh, turtles up in the air and then drop them against the rock to, and then so that they could eat them uh, to break the shell. And, uh, Kind of interesting thing. So um, let's see. So only seven tragedies survived intact of uh, written by Aeschylus. Uh, I'm going to list them here because it's uh, important. I mean, of course, fragments of others were su survived. There were fragments of uh, other uh, uh, playwrights survived as well, but only fragments. So not, not, not uh, in, in fact, not, not the whole thing. So the Aeschylus uh, uh, play, plays that survived were Persians, Seven Against Thebes, uh, the Sublions, uh, sub uh, and the trilogies known, known as uh, Aristea, uh, that, that consists of three tragedies like Agamemnon, Libation Barriers, and Eumenides, uh, and also Prometheus Bound. Uh, whose authorship 
is disputed. So now Sophocles uh, was born in 497, 496 BC, which is like 26, 27 years after um, uh, Aeschylus. Uh, he died in 406, uh, 405. Uh, and he influenced the development of drama, most importantly by adding third actor, as I said before. So he uh, reduced the importance of chorus at this point, because uh, uh, the flexibility of the play increased tremendously with the introduction of third. It's not just the dialogue, it's the whole play could take place, uh, different schemes. Um, he also developed his character to a greater extent than earlier playwrights, such as Aeschylus. Um, so Sophocles is known to write 123 plays during the course of his life, but only seven of them survived in complete form. And they are the Ajax, that uh, what Paul was talking about, uh, uh, about uh, his um, suicide, uh, just a little detail to that, that after the suicide, uh, Agamemnon refused to bury his body. So this is a, uh, you know, huge insult, uh, uh, but eventually uh, they convinced uh, uh, to do that. But, you know, that, that uh, I mean, it, it, you could see this theme uh, recurring in, 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 in in Greece because the Greeks were very uh, sensitive to the burial uh, procedures. Uh, if you remember uh, in uh, Antigone, uh, the two brothers uh, uh, who killed each other. So uh, one brother uh, was also left unburied and Antigone buried him and suffered the consequences. Um, so, so Ajax, uh, the seven uh, that survived uh, of um, Sophocles, Ajax, Antigone, uh, uh, the women of Prochus, uh, Oedipus, uh, the king, uh, Electra, Philoctetes, and uh, Oedipus at Colonna. So now the third generation is Euripides, who was born in 480 BC and died about the same time as uh, so Sophocles, 406. Um, he actually was not as popular, though he was much more <laughs> influential. Uh, so some mentioned scholars attributed 95 plays to him. Uh, of this, 18 or 19 have survived, more or less complete. Uh, so there are, uh, uh, so, so there's a lot more Euripides that we have than uh, Aeschylus and Sophocles all together. So the Aeschylus plays are divided into various periods of his life. Uh, he was very influential. Um, and the uh, early period, uh, which is, includes the tragedy of Medea and Hippolytus. Uh, then this is the early when he was young. Then patriotic period at the onset of Peloponnesian War, uh, children of Hercules and suppliants. Then there is a middle period of disillusionment and the, at the senselessness of war. This is the hero Tecuba, a woman of Troy. So he basically draw the parallel of um, suffering that Trojans suffered. Uh, Tecuba, uh, I believe, was the wife of uh, King Priamus. Uh, uh, and uh, the women of Troy, also the story uh, of how the spoils were divided and how the uh, noble women were uh, you know, you uh, taken as the spoils of war and all the suffering that stuff uh, that that happened at the time. So this is at the time when uh, uh, the, the uh, late stage of the Peloponnesian War and uh, Athenians started to suffer severe uh, consequences. Uh, then there is what they call escapist period, uh, with a focus on romantic intrigue. You know, that's after the war. Uh, and uh, not after, but like at the very end. Uh, so it's called Ion, Iphigenia in Taurus, uh, and Helen. So uh, uh, 
uh, and we know es escapists, you know, Helen escaped many lives uh, with Paris, and then Iphigenia at, in Taurus <clears throat> is a play when uh, Iphigenia was sacrificed before the, uh, the Trojan War uh, by her father Agamemnon. Uh, she actually turned out that uh, she was saved by, uh, by uh, uh, God, uh, God, uh, God and transferred to Taurus, uh, which is uh, in Crimea. And uh, later on, Orestes, uh, who was traveling there, uh, found her. Uh, and then there is a final period of tragic despair. Uh, it's called, um, and uh, the place here is uh, Orestes, Phoenician women in Parkai. So uh, Euripides identified with theatrical innovation and have profoundly influenced drama down to modern times, especially in representation of traditional mythical heroes as ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. So he, he brought more drama, he had less of mythology, more kind of reality, as if they were real people and uh, uh, probably gave them a lot, a lot more uh, human emotion. So Aristophanes, which we talk, we're gonna talk a little later uh, in comedy section, uh, he scripted him uh, as a character in at least three plays, uh, uh, Arcanians and uh, Desmo Corisai and the Frost. Well, we'll start with the last. So, Now, uh, uh, contemporaries did, did, well, didn't appreciate the reader, but it's to the same extent that they appreciated the, uh, because of maybe they were not ready for all of those changes that he introduced. Uh, now, comedy, so Athenian comedy was uh, uh, mostly um, represented at that um, the festival of Linaya early on. Uh, some of the comedies were still played at Dionysia, but mostly at the Linnaeus. So, and it's uh, Athenian comedy is conventionally divided into three periods, uh, old comedy, middle comedy, and new comedy. So old comedy survived today largely in the form of 11 surviving plays by Aristophanes. So you just think about this, that there were many comedians at the time, but the only comedies that we have from that period is the comedies from single author, Aristophanes. Uh, I don't know how they happen, and there are only 11 of them that survive. Uh, now, um, the middle comedy is largely lost completely. We have nothing survived there. And the new comedy, also very little left, and uh, it's known primarily from the substantial papyrus fragments of Menander. So, the most important uh, comic uh, dramatist is Aristophanes, born in 446. So as you can see, he is much younger than all the playwrights that we know, because the, uh, he is at least 35 years younger than the youngest uh, of them, uh, Euripides, uh, entirely different generation. So. So he, is, uh, 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 he wrote political satire, uh, abundance of, of sexual and scatological innuendo. Uh, he, uh, he basically defined the genre. Um, and uh, he lampooned the um, most important personalities and institutions of his day, uh, as can be seen, for example, in his buffoonish portrayal of Socrates in the cloud and uh, also in his uh, interwar farce, uh, the Distrata. Um, as I said, okay, so, let me see. Oh, okay, uh, so the, the difference between tragedy and comedy is, is a very interesting uh, 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 concept because uh, tragedy was usually written about mythology, and there are heroes, there are mythological heroes. While comedy was written about contemporary, ordinary people, no heroes, no kings, 
Um, so uh, it, it's really kind of huge shift um, uh, what happened. And uh, so in the comedy, uh, the typical um, uh, the typical plot is that the hero gets a great idea, then he puts it in a practice and overcomes opposition, and then he enjoys the fruits of his idea. So that's that's the typical uh, kind of pattern in a plot. So I want to say a few words about the uh, role of women here. Uh, so obviously from the uh, antiquity, the most famous one is Sappho. And uh, after Sappho, uh, who lived in the, mostly in the 6th century BC in uh, Lesbos, in the Mycenae, uh, there are very few women that uh, talk in their own voice. The law in Athens was that the woman of any age had to have a male guardian. Uh, the women could, could not own property. The age for women to get married started around 14, uh, and usually they're married to much older men. Uh, the women uh, didn't participate in ruling or governing or voting. Uh, they usually stayed inside a house, managing household. Uh, they were responsible for weaving, procuring clothes, uh, often met in the public fountains to get water and gossip. Divorce was possible. But the, uh, but the dowry had to be returned. The Tyra were a class of courtesans that Paul mentioned, entertaining men and symposium. Uh, and the women played an important role in religion, especially as priestesses, Pythias and Delphi, and also priestesses of uh, Athena uh, in Athens, uh, that's supposed to have a, enormous authority and respect, those priestesses. So this was probably the best uh, possible uh, avenues for advancement for women. Uh, there was actually one um, um, religious fest festival, uh, Thesphophoria, uh, dedicated to Demeter and, uh, and intended to bring fertility to the lands. I mean, and, uh, Aristophanes uh, actually wrote a comedy about this called Women of uh, Thesmophoria. Uh, uh, about uh, the, the men could not participate in it uh, under the uh, threat of death, actually. But then, uh, I don't know, for those who of you who read that comedy, uh, you know you, you know what happened there, that the men did try to get in there. So before we go, I just want to mention a couple of notable figures uh, in, in, the, in the fifth century. Just, um, uh, it, it, it's not related to theater, but I, I thought it's worth mentioning. Our future presentations are gonna be mostly about the political situation, the wars, you know, this is more about culture. So obviously, you know, the, the, the great uh, historian Thucydides. Um, so uh, just a few words about him. Uh, so uh, the situation happened, uh, by the way, very interesting that in, uh, on the Pericles in 451, the citizenship requirements were tightened up in Athens. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect. So before it was enough just to have a father with citizenship. Now it was also required that mother had a citizen father. So since women were not considered really citizens. Uh, but it's not only that your father now had to be a citizen, but your mother had to have a father who was a citizen of Athens. Otherwise, you were not entitled to become a citizen. So that uh, obviously number of citizens was reduced at the time. Um, so Thucydides was born in 460 uh, in well-to-do family. Uh, his father was uh, a lord. Uh, so one of the important events uh, uh, that ha uh, uh, that uh, happened, he was ostracized uh, uh, by efforts of Pericles in 443. Obviously, he was they didn't have a very good relationship. He uh, was also uh, uh, later on after he returned. Uh, if you recall, the ostracism uh, was done only for ten years. Uh, 
So when he returned to Alton, there was a plague of 428 and 427, which he survived. Uh, you know, we know that Pericles himself died from the plague, but um, Thucydides survived that. And then he was also, uh, during the Peloponnesian War, um, he was uh, a general in the North Aegean in, uh, uh, and in the city of uh, Amphipolis. In 424, uh, he actually commanded uh, 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 half of the army uh, against the Spartan general Brasidas, who was very famous and very capable general, and, and uh, uh, the Athenians were thrashed. Uh, and for that, because he lost the battle, believe it or not, he was exiled for 20 years. And he said that this exile gave him an opportunity to travel and get information from the other side. He actually, uh, he, he, he lived in Sparta for a while. He, he was actually an admirer of, of Spartan. Uh, and he, uh, uh, and this is the time when he wrote uh, uh, the history of uh, uh, Peloponnesian War is his history. Uh, he returned to Athens uh, around 400 and, and died the same year. So that, that's a uh, uh, very interesting thing. So uh, what's also interesting is uh, uh, who had influence on Thucydides? Because uh, he is one of the, uh, he really represented an, an entirely different way of presenting history. He, he is considered the most reliable, you know, no comparison to uh, Herodotus. I'm not even talking about others. Uh, so obviously Sophists were, had a tremendous influence. Sophists was uh, a, a movement, a philosophic movement in Athens at the time, uh, specifically Protagoras from uh, Abdera uh, in, in Thrace. Uh, came to Athens uh, uh, around 450, uh, played, I, I mean, we, we, you know, we could learn a lot from him from the Plato's dialogue. Uh, and the other one uh, who was also a sophist is uh, Gorgas from Sicily. He came much later in 420. So Gorgas was very interesting. He, he was an excellent uh, uh, rhetorician, uh, uh, you know, orator. Uh, so when he came, on one day, he used to give a very powerful speech on, on a subject, fixed subject. And then the very next day, he gave an equally powerful speech refuting his own argument. So this kind of emphasized the power of an argument to influence action. And that's what the sophists are about. They were uh, using um, uh, the philosophy to influence re uh, uh, events to influence uh, 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 politicians who matter. Uh, and that was part of this. Uh, I mean, that's why they got such a bad rap later on, like the, the word of Sophies, Sophies now uh, is not very positive. So another influence uh, on uh, Thucydides was obviously Hi Hippocrat, uh, Hi Hippocratic medicine. Uh, the influence is because it's had a rational scientific approach. And that, that's how the citizens uh, looked at the history. He only approached this, he only wrote about the facts that he investigated very thoroughly. He didn't write about some gossips or some stories or mythology like Herodotus did. Uh, well, obviously, um, uh, you know, tragedy, uh, Athenian tragedy played uh, a, a big influence, a big role. In, uh, and Herodotus himself, he was always trying to distinguish himself from Herodotus. Herodotus was much, much older. He was a renowned uh, historian. And he always wanted to show that his history is, is different. Uh, and Thucydides has said that his history is contemporary while Herodotus looks back and his history uh, uh, Thucydides' history void of myth and romanticism, unlike Herodotus. Uh, he concentrates on war and has no room for religion, women, and cultural practice. You know, that's what kind of uh, shows. Uh, and um, he is obsessed about his method, various points of view, and accuracy. 
He also represents different points of view, Bort and Artinian, and he is obviously very objective. Well, uh, the other uh, person, of course, I wanted to mention, Ed, and this is the end of it, uh, is uh, Socrates, obviously. This is uh, uh, the most influential guy. Just a few, th few things. I mean, obviously, it's not his full biography. Uh, we don't know, uh, we, uh, all we know about Socrates and mostly for, comes from Plato. I would say 80% of what's known about Socrates comes from Plato. So the, the main thing is that the Greeks, uh, what's uh, really unique about them, they did not have a priestly caste or sacred text or omnipotent deity. So, uh, you know, unlike many other cultures, you talk Mesopotamia, you take uh, Egypt, you know, there is always priesthood, you know, is as a very influential, you, you know, case. Uh, there is also a no tax, you know, they, so they, they, as a result, I mean, they're more practical, they're more realistic, uh, they're more scientific, and uh, obviously that probably prompted the development of the philosophy. So, uh, uh, so they, they had this, what they call quest, for truth, uh, and, and that was a human endeavor and available to any citizen without interpretation of experts. So they were educated the way they were educated. There were no oppressive texts that were interpreted by priests. So they, that's probably kind of what you say like internal freedom. They developed internal freedom and the way to uh, think um, uh, independently, um, and, uh, uh, and and come up to their own conclusion. They, they, they were not overly influenced. So uh, Athens of fifth century became a magnet and a breeding ground for intellectual thought as a result of this. So one of the earliest uh, arrivals was uh, Anaxagoras uh, of Clazomene uh, in Ionia, uh, as you know, who uh, befriended uh, what was uh, uh, in the circle of Pericles and uh, uh, leading intellectuals. Uh, it introduced an atomic theory, uh, also cosmo uh, cosmology. Um, so uh, another one was, of course, uh, we already said, Protagoras of Abdera who came to Athens and stayed there. So uh, because a lot of people um, uh, with intellectual pursuits came to Athens. Athens was the cultural center of the Greek world at the time, this century. Uh, so Socrates was born in Athens in 469 BCE. He served in the army, participated in battles. He also served in Boulé, you remember, as a result of, uh, um, as a result of the uh, Pleistenius uh, uh, um, changes. So the Boulé was formed, the Council of 500. And uh, uh, people from uh, all 10 tribes, uh, 50, 50 from each. So he served there. So again, the main source is the Plato, like maybe 80%, and also Xenophon, uh, Aristophanes, obviously, <laughs> wrote about him, not in a very uh, uh, flattering terms. So his father, Socrates' father, was a stone ma mason, and his mother was midwife. He walked around Athens and engaged in discussions, drawing the followers. His methods were to ask questions. He never offered the positive answer, but rather admitted that he doesn't really know. He heard that Oracle said that there is no man in Athens wiser than Socrates. So he tried to, to you know, he tried to refute that. And he started to talk to other people. And in his conversation with others, he concluded that they really know nothing. As for himself, he said that at least I know that I know nothing when others don't. So that's <laughs> supposedly what Socrates said. So in 399, Socrates was brought to trial by three accusers on charges of atheism and corrupting the youth. But the court usually had several hundreds of juries. There were no prosecutors or lawyers uh, in Greece, the only juries. Uh, complainers and defenders uh, stated their case before juries. That's how it was conducted. 
There is no judge to provide instruction to jury. So Socrates, uh, well, ob ob obviously jury represents, uh, there, there are a lot of them represent the, uh, how the public feels. Um, and Socrates um, actually takes the leading compla uh, complainer, Meletus, he took him apart in his arguments, obviously, but it, it didn't help. Uh, so the vote was for condemnation, uh, the second word uh, was for punishment, and jury voted for death. Socrates declined the opportunity to escape, uh, and eventually drunk a cup of Hamlet as execution required. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to go in the, all about Plato's uh, dialogues. We, we, we may talk about them sometime because there are a lot of details about it. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, uh, Greg. I think we will do a philosophy um, slash uh, Greek literature somewhere yep. down the future. So I think leave it for that. And I just yeah, want to go through. I'm, I'm finished. Yeah, I'm yeah. Finished, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was great. That was yeah, great. That, that was amazing. it. You, you managed to start talking right when I finished. <laughs> may, 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 may I have a question? Sure. Uh, Greg, uh, you mentioned about uh, hunger for truth and uh, no, no, no uh, forbidden subjects and so on. And how can we reconcile this with the fate of Socrates, who was condemned to death for basically for his views? Right. Okay. Let me so, comment on that. I, I, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Paul. I mean, there were, I mean, Socrates fundamentally was anti-democratic. I mean, if you read the Republic, it's very obvious. He comes right out, you know, talks mm -hmm. about the philosopher kings. But this was a very practical question in Athens, because in the wake of the Peloponnesian War, there had been uh, oligarchic, uh, 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 um, groups that were put in and the, the democracy was suppressed and they went back and forth. And uh, we're going to talk, for example, later about Xenophon. Xenophon was one of Socrates' leading students. And he later, be, you know, basically left Athens and went to Sparta, uh, was honored by the Spartans. So, um, and he was in that circle of Socrates. So uh, there were definitely, you know, people say, well, you know, how could they possibly do this to Socrates? But at the same time, we talk about the, the Athenian democracy and how wonderful that was. So we have to understand that that's more complicated than it sounds. And that that uh, that Socrates was, was operating in opposition to the democracy on a principled level, as well as, as, well as practical level. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not just the black and white child storybook story. Okay. Excellent. Interesting, interesting. Anybody else any, have any other questions? Uh, no. So we, we'll do, uh, um, and then Greg, maybe, maybe you can go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I have a quick question. When he was talking, uh, when Greg, you were talking about comedy, and yeah. they were making fun of who? And were they talking about foreigners? Were they talking about lower classes? I mean, who was no, the, no, they made they, they made fun of uh, of their, their own institution and also famous men. You know, they made Aristophanes made fun of uh, Socrates in many purpose. He is, uh, you know, showed him as a, some kind of buffoon, <laughs> crazy guy. You know, he uh, so he made fun. Actually, it was really great. Uh, uh, you know what Aristophanes done because he uh, he didn't uh, miss anybody uh, 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 Athenian institutions uh, uh, famous men he he made fun of themselves not foreigners I mean maybe sometimes foreigners too I mean we we know that uh, you know they made uh, 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 fun of uh, gold for instance like they were the, like in one of the plays I remember uh, you know but. He made fun of everybody, and, uh, and, and especially about the Athenians themselves. One of his most famous plays was um, Lysistrata. And right. the basic idea of Lysistrata is the women get together, and uh, Athenian women get together with the Spartan women and say, look, this war is ridiculous. We're mm -hmm. going to go on strike, and we're going to refuse to have sex with our husbands. 
and all of and all of the the men um of course have this sort of reaction that you would expect and uh so that 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 was uh you know a strongly comic thing but you know a very sensitive topic and i mean this was a city that was at war for its survival and they're making fun of the very idea of war and you know making sexual jokes about it interesting but it's also a good point um a lot of their like focuses for example was not fully greek Homer was not, you know, had a Phoenician blood in him. There's a lot of it that they're not Dorian Greeks. We're not talking about, a lot of them were actually had, you know, uh, had foreign blood in them. So this is interesting. Also, Greg yeah. uh, Greg mentioned the difference between Aristophanes and what was called the new comedy. And Menander is the, the, uh, the, the best known figure, but we have almost none of his work. We have no complete work from him, him at all. Yeah. Yeah, but what we do one. have are the works of the Roman playwright Plautus. And Plautus, he's called a playwright, but really he was a translator. And he just translated Menander into Latin. So we do know what a lot of these plots were and what they worked. So the new comedy was the ancestor of what's called Commedia dell'arte, uh, which are, um, I mean, it's kind of like, the, the really ancestor of, of a sitcom where you have these these stereotypical characters, you know, uh, the, the clever slave uh, who becomes later Figaro um, is, is, this, is directly uh, a descendant of characters in, in Menander. So you have, you know, the clever slave who outsmarts everybody. You have uh, the, the, the young man and the young woman who want to get together, but they're poor. At the end, they all turn out to be, have royal blood. And then you have the, the old, um, pompous old man. And so all of, so the Commedia dell'arte, the, or the, the new comedy, were ones in which you just had these stock characters that would get together and kind of riff off each other. And it would always be about how the Figaro character was making fools of his aristocratic masters and owners, uh, which became pretty controversial when it was Figaro in the, you know, in the uh, in the eighteenth century. Yeah, I want to uh, I want to make a connection of today's presentation to a little bit of what <laughs> um, Paul had said. Uh, it was interesting when Russia conquered uh, Germany during World War Two, the Midas um, treasure that was found by Schliemann magically disappeared <laughs> and they found it in a warehouse in Russia uh, is 70 years or 80 years later. So just to kind of like Greek art, all the stuff that Schliemann had found in uh, 19th century uh, Midas and just to connect it to the World War II and the Russian front, <laughs> so to speak. And I just want to go a little bit about schedule. Um, so um, the next, uh, in the next two weeks on the uh, ancient stuff we have a persian war marathon and it's going to be lisa and richard on 9 19. tomorrow um as you know we have a special guest uh joshua uh, um he's going to talk about the uh unification of norway and harold the fine hair who watched vikings he's very clearly depicted there um as a nemesis to uh, uh ragnar uh, Lothbrok, uh, but um, and then they'll talk about the uh, Viking conquest of Iceland. So tomorrow at four o'clock, and um, on our um, uh, regular modern uh, presentation, we have Russian four um, and uh, motives. John is going to talk about it on nine thirteen, and also John is up for Gilgamesh on nine sixteen. And the text that we we're recommending to read is the. Uh, Andrew George, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, it's basically the recommended text to read. Well, George is the uh, leading scholar of Gilgamesh right now, and his book is, he just, I wasn't going to do it, but I discovered there was a second edition in 2000, last year, and it's, uh, it's up to date, uh, because something like, Gilgamesh is not like um, Homer, is you have sort of a unitary, um, 
text that's been passed down through generations. Gilgamesh is a bunch of fragmented tablets that people are constantly finding new ones. So the, the, the epic keeps changing. So um, I thought George was, would, he puts the most focus on that. So I thought that would be good. It's available on Kindle, by the way. So yeah, it's on Kindle for eight something. So um, well, thank you guys. And uh, so, so I'll, po I'll post it up already as well. I mean, I did, um, some people don't have an email um, well, I mean, I don't have their emails and stuff like that. And then uh, don't forget at 920, we're doing the uh, uh, first in the series of uh, restaurant outings, which is gonna be restaurant and food. We're gonna talk about food, uh, of Georgian food and a uh, and little bit of history there as well. And uh, we'll post it all. We're not gonna eat it, we're just gonna talk about it. We, we're not gonna, <laughs> we, it would, actually you already ate it, so. <laughs> Paul is not interested now. He needs to find well, a new you'll, restaurant. You'll be using your prior knowledge. <laughs> no, but, but, but it's, uh, you have to mention, it, it's outside, right? There is an outside Yes, sitting it's outside there. sitting. Oh, okay. I will, um, I'm going to be making a reservation because I don't know, it's already 12 people. So I, I yeah, need to Yeah, but you got to check. You got to check if uh, all yeah, the people are serious. Distance. That's not going to be easy with 12 people. Well, I don't think uh, uh, half of them will make it. Yeah, well, you, you, you just got to contact them and say, well, please right. uh, confirm uh, whether you make it or not. And, and also looking for suggestion, if anybody knows any scholars, uh, we'll try to make it once a month. Uh, somebody who is you know, invited uh, is going to talk about certain topics. I reached out to a couple of Mesopotamian scholars, but I got zilch. Uh, basically, one guy came back to me and said, you know, how much dineros will I get as well? <laughs> So far, this is just you know applause and you know and, and you know a little crickets. <laughs> yeah, but who was it? Uh huh. Yeah. Who was it? Um, I'll send you an email. I have her okay. email. Yeah, it, it's pretty it's pretty disgusting, but whatever it is, what it is. She wasn't actually on. Um, I don't know if any, anybody has the. Uh, um, it's what the hell is this called? One second. Um, uh, it's called Great Courses. She did the whole Mesopotamian. Oh, that used to be the teaching company. Yeah. So she, she did the whole Mesopotamian um, uh, topic, and she was pretty great. Uh, Lisa something. Um, I have to look at her last name. But hmm. she said, thank you, but no thank you. And then there's a couple other ones that I haven't re replied back. But uh, hopefully Joshua tomorrow will have a lot of the teachers and scholars that in his network. You, you really got to give them a break, you know, I mean, the, when, they, when, they, when they do go speak for free, it's usually in front of an audience of their peers, they're presenting their most current research and things like that, and they do get paid, this is their profession, you know, no, they're, not, yeah. they're not amateurs. Yeah, it, we, we probably should look more for like aspiring writers. Who did the research in a particular thing. which is what this is what this you is know, what should, right because right. these people are interested in promoting their books and they are willing to speak for free because it's kind of a promotion but the uh, very good very good actually i have a um i know a lot of russian professors but i don't know if they know english that's the problem and there was <laughs> that's the only problem so, We're gonna run, uh, uh, big problem yeah, we can volunteer. Uh, Three of us at least can go. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> you no. have to be a professional interpreter. Right. No, that, there is actually that easy. There, there is actually <laughs> a, a great Russian. Uh, uh, it's like a talk show, historical talk show, and they invite professors over. And I reached out to a couple of them, and one of them speaks English. But I don't know if it's on the level, <laughs> but uh, she's a professor. She. Um, you know, she knows Minoan uh, culture really well, and she did the presentation on it. It was really spectacular. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I, I need them to speak proficiently, obviously, you know, uh, not, not, you know, be able to express. I actually, I, I actually have a guy, who, a, a Japanese guy, who wants to do a presentation on history of Japan, but I don't know. He's, last time he spoke, it was barely understood what he said. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, Hadrian might be taking up, you know, Taka. I don't know you guys heard, you know, when he was here last time. So, yeah, well, well, yeah, we got, we got to be careful because we, we don't want to have, uh, <laughs> you know, like something boring or uh, barely understood. And, and also, I mean, you could imagine 
why someone who is a, you know, a scholar doesn't want to be presented along with presentations by those of us who are not. You know, it's, there's something yeah. inappropriate about that to me. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Uh, I mean, I, I was hoping, you know, we'll be like a more like a Q&A type of questions. You know, we have plenty of questions, obviously, we, we have developed or, you know, for Mesopotamia at least. And I wanted to bring somebody to kind of close the subject. Uh, but yeah, you guys, you guys- I'm not gonna find it. somebody that's gonna come in and do Q and A without having given some presentation that people are gonna do Q and A about. No, like generally in Mesopotamia, like for example, we, there's so that's a- exactly what you're not gonna get. Right. Someone to come and say, well, let's talk about people's general knowledge because their attitude would be people have no general knowledge. Well, they, they did a, they, there's a chemist that did a presentation on, on ancient, ancient beer and me and Greg visited that. Greg didn't like the presentation, but um, she was a historian and a chemist, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't all that. But, I mean, uh, to me, it, it was boring. I read a paper on ancient cheese. <laughs> it, was, it was about how um, the, the ancient Greeks used to have used to grate cheese in their wine. And this was showing uh, archeological discovery of ancient cheese graters. <laughs> so you could imagine that that would only interest a very small specialist audience. Yeah, but we have uh, today, Eva. Eva, are you on? Uh, and uh, Stephanie. Eva, can you introduce yourself and then Stephanie? Because we kind of like have a, a going thing here where we introduce ourselves. And Eva, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Ava, actually, Ava Henye, uh -huh. and I'm a volunteer at the Royal Ontario Museum. And actually, I know everyone there, from Josh, who's the director, down. Oh, really? <laughs> He's presenting tomorrow, by the way. Josh Basagis? Yeah! He is? No, no, it's not, it, that's not, um, that's not, Joshua, but it's another anyway. Joshua. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was, that was, that was uh, no, his name is Sinclair. Sorry. Yeah, but what I was going to say is um, I came across you quite by accident, gentlemen, and thank mm -hmm. you. But what I'm finding, um, for instance, the Aga Khan Museum, and I'll send you the link, Zach, mm -hmm. they are uh, doing a virtual uh, gala, and it's going to be global. And I suppose where I'm going from is that. If you need speakers, I'm finding that, um, like the, uh, what is it, the Na National Art Council of Washington mm -hmm. gets speakers from all over the world, including Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could go and sort of like, we had a speaker from the British Museum. If you want speakers, uh, uh, and that's how it seems for me what you could do is link to them and they would link into you. No, I understand. Yeah, I, I also want to find somebody who is exciting, you know, who, you know, who would oh, yes, uh, make it more, because we, and me and Greg, of, yeah, and me and Greg, humor, go ahead. And, and a sense of humor, uh, gentlemen, you all have that and you need that when you give a great lecture. Yeah, you know, like it's exciting. It's, it, yes. it, it's, you know, you can learn from it and people are excited. And Stephanie, can you introduce yourself? Sorry. Stephanie? Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie. I just recently joined your group, and um, I was listening intently. Actually, I just didn't really, I don't have, obviously, anything to give to the group, so I was kind of, like, just lurking around. But, Paul, you were amazing. Like, that was just a lot to take in. So, um, yeah, very nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know. What, what do you do, uh, Stephanie, just in general? Uh, in general, um, yeah. I'm an insurance broker, so okay. a lot of excitement there. <laughs> no, no, I know, but uh, if you love history, you know, we hear- Oh, I'm sorry, about... you just, I thought you meant like what I do for work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of a, just like amateur historian. I just find it cool to like, just read, especially about like, I, I always found like Greek civilization and like, pantheons and stuff like that to be very interesting from a very young age. So, but just in general history, I find pretty fascinating. Um, I'm part of like a philosophy meetup as well. So it's kind of like also a historical perspective that I'm, I'm kind of gaining from there. So um, yeah, but you guys are the first that is um, like art 
and and like really ancient history, which I also find really fascinating. So right. you're in luck because uh, up until January on an ancient history, we're discussing Hellenistic uh, and oh, okay. you know, uh, Greek cult, you know, culture, and then we're going to go into Africa, and then we'll come back to Rome. Which is oh, really that's exciting. awesome because yeah, African yeah. like everything that's exotic, basically. For yeah, for yeah, uh, we will definitely at some point touch on on India you know Harappan Empire and all that other stuff That's you know it's just cool. it's just we have so many presentations you know we make it exciting we we do an ancient one one week the next week we do the uh, modern one like we do World War two next week uh, okay. then the following week we do uh, we're gonna do uh, a marathon which is the uh, Darius uh, fighting the Greeks and stuff like that so and it's I'm, yeah, yeah and I, then, I heard something about the Persians and then also tomorrow we have a scholar that's going to join us, um, Joshua Super. And then um, you know we're going to do also like a you know Q and A at some point. I don't know. I have to figure it out. Where like one of our subject matters is going to be where did Hitler went wrong um, in uh, Russian war? You know, or you know basically give it give it a topic and somebody is going to just talk. You know, be you know receiving questions from everybody like a Q and A session. For like one like hour. an expert will be there like, like well no no it's, it's all it's gonna, all gonna be asked like I said, let's say it's gonna be john and then okay. you know uh, we'll ask him questions and then he'll present his idea and then everybody else will pitch and say well this is why i think it happened you know he buy it into you know with generals and stuff like that and he was a control freak and stuff like that okay so, so that like type of thing you know yeah own opinions and do you guys yeah. do that often or is that like just not that's like every like quarter or something we meet every week quarter. we meet every week uh, okay. so and uh since you signed up you know we have the schedule on there we mm -hmm. have you know once you sign up for the like i saw you signed up for uh, other um uh you know our presentations and li you know zoom link is on there as well so you can just go in and yeah and eva, I, a, eva is the same way yeah ava is the same way you can go into those you know you know in fact we have our new um i mean relatively new james you know joined uh, recently I, I snatched him off from another group that i was in current <laughs> events right james <laughs> mr sinclair mm -hmm. oh he's he's probably on the mute or something <laughs> yeah i just like to say uh -huh. the adage you're never too old to learn no and in, in fact in russia they have a saying you know you, you know you live a hundred years and you learn a hundred years you know so it's 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 a saying Come on, Greg, say something. I know you. Well, you're trying. I, I, I personally uh, learn a lot by preparing for, for this presentation. And, <laughs> and, and Greg, I do. I Greg, take some courses. Yeah. Yeah, Greg, yeah, that's what I'm about to say that every time, let's say, he does Assyrian or he does Babylonian, he takes courses. He takes his time. Not, not every time, but not I every took time, a few mostly, courses. Yes. Mostly just courses from your head because you already know it. So, uh, uh, no, and, not, not really. Uh, well, honestly, uh, uh, whatever I know, I, I always learn a lot more when I take a course and on a deeper level. Uh, it's really amazing. It's, it's very humbling to tell you the yeah. truth. <laughs> and uh, Paul, thank you. It was really amazing presentation. It was next level. Uh, I, know, I, don't, I don't know why we, we keep topping you know, the top. <laughs> this is not impossible. I must say I'm really pumped by the way that it seems to me that the, the quality of the presentations really seems to be getting better and better across all the presenters all the time. It's really, you know, maybe what, the, you know, the, the best type of what the Greeks would call competition. Yeah, I mean, and we're all friends. Uh, and again, if you feel like you want to present something, let's say stuff and you have something you want to present, uh, even if the history of, an, you know, uh, of some country or 1700s or something like that, we can also put it in and if you're passionate about it, you know, we could. Well, the, the, at the moment that I feel as excellent and as amazing as what I saw there with Paul, as you know, when I'm a, maybe a quarter of that level, I will let you know that, you know, I'm, I'm certainly um, able to present, but at the moment I'm like, I just, just okay. wanna like absorb everything you guys are offering, <laughs> so. What about like, you, James? You. you have yeah, anything? I we won't, I just, go ahead. I just found the unmute button. So, uh, okay. Yes. Do you have any, do you have any, uh, first of all, your impression as a group and you're relatively new a couple of weeks. 
and um, Stephanie is here and Ava just joined first time. Do you like the group? You know, no, I absolutely do. I mean, it, it, and I think the format, the uh, idea of having classical one week and then uh, more modern history the next is, is ideal. And um, I've just got to find out where your YouTube channel is. Oh, um, I will send you uh, an email, but I also uh, just put it through chat, uh, chat. And so if you go to chat for the uh, Zoom, you will mm -hmm. see, um, you know, uh, but I'll, I'll post it there again. Yeah, we log out. do that since the top, that'd be, that'd, that'd be no great. No problem, because I also put you on my, if you're getting all my emails with uh, adjusted schedules and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, so one of them also had my YouTube channel. Uh, I mean, it's, so to speak, is our YouTube channel and stuff like that. And, yeah, um, fascinating. And, and also, to, uh, Stephanie had asked me, how do you prepare for this, um, you know, pre-classical Greek um, art uh, presentation? And Paul, you know, what type of readings would you suggest and stuff like that? Or can we create a, something like where we can post the readings prior to the people, li you know, listening in so they're, they're more involved and, and educated about this stuff? Yeah. yeah. Well, I actually did show the book that I used, you know, in the, the beginning of my presentation. Uh, Robin Osborne, Archaic and Classical Greek Art. Um, but it's also, really you know, it's like you do this and you're, especially when you're, you're looking for images. So you're going on, on the, you know, you're Googling them and then you're just kind of having like a treasure hunt from uh, site to site. And sometimes you find really excellent sites and sometimes you find really kind of silly sites and it's the internet. Okay. And, and, and James, I guess, uh, do you have any subject matters you want to discuss on a modern history? Uh, anything I can add? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say that I'm most interested in the ancient uh, history. I mean, I found the, the, the Russian areas was quite interesting. I mean, from a personal point of view, I'm I'd be interested in the uh, uh, the history leading up immediately to the war in Europe, uh, which we haven't covered, or maybe you've covered it before. No, we haven't. We we did something like we did rip and drop Molotov Pact. Right. Uh, Mikhail did that. And it was an amazing job too. Um, it would be interesting to see somebody, you know, in the way that Aaron did. Uh, the, the build up to the war in the Pacific, which was tremendously detailed. And I mean, I, I learned about things that I never even knew existed. And I thought that I was reasonably well informed. Uh, so it would be really good if someone had the ability and the time to take on something like that with Europe. Yeah, and it, I, I have a personal interest. My father was from Poland and he's, he, he, Sinclair is not our original name. Uh, he survived the war. Um, in, 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 but he, um, I, I never quite understood. It, it, it was very clear from what he used to tell me that they didn't expect the war that quickly. Although it, 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 people in England, for example, had been, they had that phony war for a year and they were expected, but in uh, his shuttle, they did not expect. Wow. The, in, the invasion and his town was um, uh, Yaroslav is, is, is now a border town. Of course, it was in the middle of Poland in, in prior to the war. But it was. Let me show everybody a book that, that I can recommend. Uh, a Chill in the Air. Chill in the Air. This is written by an American expatriate in, in Italy. It is her diary in 1938. And she talks about what it was like to be riding on a railroad car and having all these fascisti coming in who were going to a fascist conference and the, you know, what it was like in those, you know, eight, eight months right before the war broke out. A really chilling and fascinating book. A Chill in the Air by Iris Origo. Yeah. I mean, I, I, right. I, I mean, I, I've read some accounts of, uh, American, German Americans traveling to Germany in 1930s, you know, before the Olympics and during the Olympics, 
they were sorely fascinated how Hitler did an amazing job of brainwashing everybody there. They were just nationalists everywhere. Just like when you look at Russians right now, what Putin did with Russians, they actually have comedy shows that bash gay people and bash everybody. And it's like on a national TV, no, no issues of any, you know, um, compassion to a any human. It's unbelievable what Putin did. He, he completely brainwashed the whole society. It's crazy. And that's, that's what, and then we're looking at it right now. It's present time Russia. Uh, God forbid you say something against USSR right now, and there's a Russian guy on the other side. He, he says, you're an idiot. USSR was the best thing that ever happened to Russia. <laughs> I was like, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> yeah. Tell that to several million Ukrainian peasants. Yeah, that, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, Stephanie, you had a question, sorry? Oh, apologies. And it wasn't a question. I just want to make sure. I think I had seen that um, presentation of Aaron's that he was talking about. Was it the in the Pacific? Pacific War, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, Pacific War and whatnot. He had shared a link at in the other meetup that we're a part of. And it was excellent. It was just like, it captivated me from the beginning, except for like, you know, the PowerPoint, the first PowerPoint was a lot of words, but you know, <laughs> I had to wear my glasses, but I mean, it was just amazing. It was really good. So then again, yeah. I'm biased because Aaron's, you know, I know him and he's cool. So, and there were a few other people that spoke in the, in the video as well. It wasn't just him. So, right. Yeah. It was Paul spoke, um, uh, Hadrian oh, Paul. spoke. Yeah, um, Greg, I mean, we're all, you know, it's an open oh. format, so we, we yeah, participate. One thing, one thing that we've really done with this group that's been unusual and successful is that we encourage people to interrupt. <sighs> I mean, oh. there are a lot of, lot of, a lot of well, things like this where people say, hold your questions to the end, you know, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. We've discovered that by encouraging discussion while we're doing the presentation, we really, it, it really enriches the whole thing, especially if people have, you know, respect and they know when, when it's too much and so forth. But it's really, I think that's what's one of the things that's unique about this group is the, the, uh, the way that people can jump in during the presentations and uh, at least for me, it gives special enjoyment of that. Is there well, any just, time that it's like a cacophony of, sorry, it's again, Zachary, but is no, there any ahead, like yeah. times that there's like, it is a cacophony of people like trying to happened, like go in this because happened. there's so many opinions? People no. have been respectful and waiting for other people to speak. And as long as we yeah. can continue that, it works. Well, James had said a good point. James, remember uh, when you just joined, he said, Zach, I can't believe you have 30 people on and how cordial mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, uh, so cool mm -hmm. everybody is, right, James? Yeah, no, absolutely. It is. Uh, a, 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 I think it's because of the format in particular, because somebody is is leading the discussion. Uh, a lot of the other, uh, I mean, there are a lot of other good meetups, but most of the history ones seem to devolve into uh, arguments. Correct. Everybody that uh, connects from LA to San Francisco to Chicago that connect to us, their point was, you know you know some of them are talking about like mysticism like aliens in ancient time like <laughs> let's not let's not divert there is <laughs> we're not talking about houdini here okay this is this is real history okay this is facts and um and by the way you can tell aaron i posted his uh video on linkedin uh -huh. and he got 500 hits 500 people viewed his videos <laughs> That's oh, ridiculous. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't realize he was on LinkedIn. I should probably like add my, you know, buddies and whatnot from yeah. meetups actually, because yeah, I just thought, you know, I that, would totally have hit that too on LinkedIn. Should I stop the recording. Uh, no, you're still uh, recording. Still recording. Cool, which is cool. Which is cool should because yeah, yeah, you can stop. I mean, you know, it's it's fine. You know, no cam no cameras. <laughs>